Heavenly Father, today we put on the full armor to protect us against attack. We put on the belt of truth to protect against lies and deception. We put on the breastplate of righteousness to protect our hearts from the temptations. We put the gospel of peace on our feet to walk in your light, peace, and freedom with the Holy Spirit. We rebuke anxious thoughts. We take up your shield of faith for protection to block and destroy all the darts and threats thrown at us by the enemy. We put on the helmet of salvation to cover our minds and thoughts, reminding us that we are children of a mighty king. We are forgiven, set free, saved by the blood of Jesus. We take up the sword of the spirit, your living word, that has the power to demolish strongholds and is sharper than any double-edged sword. We come to you, Lord, in prayer daily. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. What's up, you guys? Welcome to The Imagination. I'm your host, Emma, and this week I'm honored to introduce to you someone who has become a very special person and dear friend in my life and who has a tremendous testimony that I'm thrilled for you all to hear. Introducing Woman of God, Voice for the Voiceless, Satanic Ritual Abuse, Human Trafficking, Freemasonic, and MKUltra Mind Control Survivor, Program Multiple, Generational Trauma Circuit Breaker, Professional Angler, and Bass Fisherman, Traveler, former gaming industry worker, and one of the kindest, sweetest, and most generous people I've ever met, Kate Field. <laughs> Kate was born into a multi-generational, incest-based, Masonic bloodline family dating back at least a thousand years. She just recently began recalling memories of her abuse about a year and a half ago and has slowly been piecing together the puzzle of her life. Deconstructing a thousand plus years of history is no easy task, and it's really impressive what Kate has been able to reverse engineer and put back together about her life, her abuse, and the personal affiliations her family has had to people and places in history that you would all recognize by name. Although she isn't 100% sure of her role in the cult system, she does know that she was used for highly technical jobs, and she'll explain that in her own words in this interview. Unraveling the web of deception of her life has been nothing short of the hardest thing Kate has ever done, and I ask you all to say a prayer of protection for her and over this podcast as you listen. This is the first time Kate is speaking out publicly using her last name, and she risks a lot coming forth speaking her truth. From the body memories resulting in literal physical side effects that we will show you in photos, flashbacks to disobeying and even going against the same mind control that her abuser spent so much time to program into her subconscious, Kate standing here today before us is nothing short of a miracle. Those who tried to break her didn't realize she would flip the script and that the only thing breaking would be the cycle of generational trauma and abuse. You may recognize Kate after seeing her on Lisa Meister's podcast, Only God Rescued Me, and I just want to take a moment and praise her for coming on to the imagination and doing her second podcast in such a short amount of time. <laughs> it takes an extreme amount of strength and courage to be able to get up in front of an audience and divulge the most horrific and horrible things you've ever been through. Kate is an extremely brilliant and eloquent speaker with a gentle heart and has been led by the Holy Spirit to be here today sharing with us. One thing I love about Kate is her close relationship with God and how she is fully led by his word and glory. I know you will all fall in love with her and be just as inspired in the same ways that I have been. We have so much to learn from survivors, and Kate is an absolute wealth of knowledge and a beacon of light. She has been one of the biggest supporters of this podcast, showing up almost every Sunday for the YouTube premieres, validating and encouraging every guest, and supporting every platform I have ventured off into. I want to personally say thank you to Kate because of her constant encouragement has been such a huge influence on me and on this podcast and has left a lasting imprint on my heart. I ask you all to put down whatever you're doing and give Kate your full attention. What you're about to hear will be a lot of new information as well as information that actually corroborates with past guests like Nathan Reynolds and Faye Russell. Before I finish introducing this week's guest, I want to give a reminder that if you are a survivor or whistleblower who wants to share your story or who wants to share any information privately with me, you can email me at imaginabetterworld2020 at gmail.com. Please send me a briefing of who you are and how I can support you, whether it's through podcasting or sharing information. And I also recently started a Substack that I'd love to have your support on. And you can find that at www.emmacatherine.substack.com. I've been doing weekly podcast recaps and insights on the podcast. And this is a place that I've been using to publicly journal my journey as an advocate for our children. 
All my social email and project links can be found in the show notes. And as always, I'm so grateful for all your support. So you guys, without further ado, please help me in welcoming this week's guest of honor, survivor advocate, anti-child abuse activist, overcomer, all around inspiration, and someone who's become a dear friend. The one, the only, Kate Field. Kate, thank you so much for being here with me. Uh, I don't know <laughs> what to do with that. I don't know. <laughs> that is, boy, that is, a, that's, that's a little overwhelming for me, but, but thank you. <laughs> you deserve it. Uh, you I mean, deserve I will try to live up to <laughs> what I've been built as. But frankly, people like I just told uh, I just told Emma like um, I'm just sort of cannonballing in there. I'm pretty nervous, and um, this is hard stuff to talk about. And I'm um, when I did Lisa's podcast, I told her that I told her I had been drafted by the, by the Holy Spirit because the way that had worked. And this is really the same thing. Um, Holy Spirit had had told me like to talk to Emma and I was like really <laughs> like I'm really <laughs> can I please get some like confirmation on this Holy Spirit because this is um <clears throat> this is hard and not something that was my wonderful and bright idea <clears throat> so hey obedient <laughs> obedient here and just what to even and praying about like do I do I use my name even? It's a big risk for me personally and and reputationally and, and with my family because um, I haven't gone there with them and and all these things. But I want to stand in truth and and talk about my experience um, and talk about how Jesus has really rescued me in this and is healing me in this and. And this whole journey, and I'm, I'm not sure I can be as eloquent and well spoken as like Nathan and and other people who, when I watch, I feel like they have it all together. <laughs> um, You've only I'm spoken in, out. This is your second time. They've been speaking and, out for years. <laughs> I and I'm not even years into this. I'm That's like, um, I mean, I'm two years into following Jesus and a year and a half of any kind of healing really just 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 over a year of like understanding like I'm that I'm DID and and SRA and what all this is and I've been on like the express train I feel of (laughs) of healing and I'm grateful for that but it's a lot and um I'm grateful that Holy Spirit has blessed me with the ability to actually use my voice right now because there's times with um programming has kicked in especially I was telling telling you about like this don't tell don't talk programming that I even experienced yesterday in trying to talk about some hard things with some friends and I was like three hours of like a hot mess not able to like get words out except like this is me and sobbing (laughs) And not in like a physical feeling, like a physical pain in my body, trying to put words out. And it's the, before I did Lisa's podcast, it was the same thing. I had this meltdown and I drove from like, I have a rental house. I drove from the rental driveway to my home's driveway and back and forth. I burned a whole tank of gas driving like four or five hours from driveway to driveway, like with parts just like all over the place and with just program and flip out so so please holy spirit (laughs) just guide my words and i just hope that that this what i talk about is helpful to other people in this because that's the hard part when you go through this you don't know what's happening to you and you feel like you're crazy and you're trying to even figure out like what it is i'm feeling sometimes you have things that come out in your body first and not like a memory you feel it in your body um or you just things are weird things click off and you and you're not sure and you're trying to find information and who do you talk to and you feel like you're just coming unraveled all the time and um so if that's you 
like welcome aboard <laughs> welcome aboard you're not alone in that and it helps to know that you that other people are going through that same stuff and and it is a, it's definitely like a very intense battle to get out of it oh. Well, that's almost, you know, what we're talking <laughs> about. Yeah, like how we were talking last night about how we live really in this picture perfect culture where it's very uncomfortable for people to think about being vulnerable with another person. You know, and I just ask everybody when somebody comes up to you and says, how are you? We always say, good, how are you? Like, there's not this, well, I'm really struggling today. Like, you never hear people say how they really feel. We're just conditioned to just spit out these really positive things. You know, we're, we're trained to put pictures up online with filters, you know, like everything in life. It's like, we have to show up and, and look our best and be our best, you know, and that's not reality, you know, more often than not, like we're all struggling with something. We're all hurting. We're all healing from something to different degrees and kinds, of course and on different levels, but, you know, having these types of conversations, I feel like is so important to sort of normalize that again and to come together and be genuine, you know, and talk about authentic things that like we're actually going through. It's validating, you know, it's really lonely to be in this picture perfect world to look everywhere and everybody looks like a model and everything's perfect and everybody's good whenever you ask them how they're doing. And it's yeah. like, gosh, well, I don't feel part of that. Like I'm struggling. I don't feel good. I don't feel perfect. Like, no matter how many filters I put on myself, I'm still hurting, you know? And, yeah. and I think when you actually have these vulnerable conversations and we show up and we're like, we're not okay. You know, like I'm still healing. I'm on, I'm on a path. I'm on a journey. I just started healing, you know, and I didn't know that I had things to heal from until a year and a half ago. That surprise touches, <laughs> <laughs> that touches people who are like, gosh, me too. You know, that makes me feel so much, so much more, mm -hmm. um, or, or rather less alone, I guess I should say, makes me feel less alone with where I'm at because I feel some, I'm struggling with something, you know? So I really appreciate you coming on. You have just literally woken up to all of this a year and a half ago. That, you know, is inconceivable for a lot of survivors I have had on the show that, you know, at a year and a half in their journey, they weren't even considering speaking out you know it was it just wasn't where they were at I think it's incredible that you've been given this task by God and that you followed it you know despite it being something I not fail <laughs> please don't let me fail Lord I've trust in you that I will be okay in this so so I'd like for you to just talk about that for a minute what was it that you know I know that this was a calling it wasn't your idea but can you walk us through like at least this podcast what was it, what were you told or what was the feeling that you had at that time? What did you experience for you to speak out? And then sort of this time around, what was it that, that you felt and experienced? Well, first time around, um, I actually had discovered Lisa on your podcast talking about Halloween. And I actually, I really recommend y'all check that out, please, because if you don't know what's going on with Halloween, like it's an eye opener, and as an SRA survivor, it's it's even more so of a difficult task. Um, but I had I had discovered her podcast that way, and I, and I watched another podcast her talking about spiritual warfare, and I feel like some people maybe come to Jesus and like they accept Jesus and everything's like bubbly and happy or whatever. And they learn things as they go. Like I came to Jesus, like in a war zone and I sort of got handled, handed a sword and said, go start swinging is how I feel. I started in spiritual warfare. And so I was watching a podcast as so she was interviewing someone talking about spiritual warfare. And I commented who, I commented on the thing and um she reached out and asked if I would go on the sh on her podcast and I prayed and I was like this I was like okay first I was like what <laughs> and the Holy Spirit like should I and before I could finish my question <laughs> the Holy Spirit's like yes I'm like no no wait wait no really like <laughs> like let me finish my question first. And he's like, he's like, no, yes, do it. And that was followed by a lot of, um, I was, I would say sort of Gideon-esque where I'm like, you know, hiding, hiding in the wine press, mighty warrior, hiding in the wine press. 
and asks constantly for like validation of like, is he really supposed to go to like, so I was putting out, uh, somebody said, put out a fleece like Gideon. I didn't even know what that meant. So I just started like, like a literal, do I have to go buy a literal <laughs> fleece? But I learned that was just, you know, just ask. And so I just did a lot of asking, like, are you sh sure? Cause I wanted to test, test the spirits. They say test the spirits. Like, because I've been under such warfare sometimes, you got to make sure like you're hearing from the Holy Spirit and especially with um, people coming out of satanic ritual abuse and spiritual warfare. You've got to make sure that you're hearing the Holy Spirit, because I have had instances where that has not been the case, like stuff gets said to me and I'm like, was that the Holy Spirit? So I want to always make sure and test that. So I, I ask a lot of questions. <laughs> You know, to make sure that I know in my knower and I'll get a confirmation uh, from him on that. So that was that was with Lisa's podcast. And this one, um, I was just in church and um, I got a notification on my phone for like your um, podcast that was going to happen that night. I mean, I get them like every week and I, I saw a notification. Holy Spirit is like, I want you to talk to Emma. <laughs> and I'm like, Okay. Not yet. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah. Like, can we? I'm gonna ask you after this service, and I'm like all through service, like really. So, and I believe I reached out to you something to the effect of like, "Hey, so Holy Spirit told me to talk to you, and I, I'm just being here, obedient and doing that. It's not my bright idea." <laughs> so, yeah. So that's sort of how that went. Um, and I I feel like I've gone through since the podcast I did with Lisa, like I have gone through so much and learned so much. Um, <laughs> like it's like two different worlds in a way, even though that was like November, it feels like it could have been like 10 years ago for me. Like uh, I've been going through, through it, <laughs> but so <laughs> That's incredible. What a neat story to be able to tell. I love that you say you were drafted, you know, God's <laughs> like, I pick you, you're on my team. Let's go get him. You're like, wait, I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not ready. But in, in some ways I am in the yeah. spiritual warfare yeah. sense, because you're like perfect. I said, are you all right? <laughs> like, so the way this all started um, really was when I, like I, I'm going to blame COVID. I'm just going to, first of all, I'm going to blame COVID for all this stuff that has happened in my life because, <laughs> because this was not my idea of how I was going to spend like my early fifties, uh, like going, going through being an SRA survivor and figuring out what the heck is going on. But when COVID hit, um, I pretty much like did something inside of me about being locked up and locked down. And, um, I was start. I was bass fishing uh, tournaments around that time, and uh, I just left. Like I packed up my my car with a bag of clothes and my fishing gear and my kayak, and I just left. And I didn't know where I was going. And I drove pretty much for like two years. I had one like some stops in between, obviously, but. Like I put on over a hundred thousand miles on my vehicle, uh, just driving and driving, and um, that when I when I was going to tournaments, um, and I had like an idea. I had an idea of God. I didn't really understand it. I thought maybe I. I mean, I didn't have a relationship with Jesus, but I actually had been at a tournament in Oklahoma. In Broken Boat, Oklahoma, and I met I met a couple at this boat ramp. There's like just me and this couple pulls up at a boat ramp to put their kayak in, and I start talking. They were mutual friends of people I knew, but I had never met them. Um, and they had invited me like the next night to go to a a fellowship meeting, and I'm like, I. I think what, when I was in middle school, like I had like gone to people's like youth group things or whatever, <laughs> so, you know, like I'd shown up at those, but 
Um, so I went and that, and I remember like, um, he had asked like, what do you guys fight for? And I'm like, well, I fight for love. Like, I mean, my heart was sort of aligned in the right place, but I'm completely lost. But, um, and that sort of started my walk of following, trying to follow Jesus and learning about Jesus and what that all was. Um, and it turned out like the, you know, his wife is a survivor. So I met, you know, they're really like my best friends now on a boat ramp in Oklahoma, another su survivor. And, and they walked with me to, to learn about, they walked with me to Jesus. And so, um, I accepted it. I accepted Jesus outside of a bar and grill in Pennsylvania <laughs> on the sidewalk. And I think there was like some miniature deliverance going on. I don't know what was happening. I just was like saying the words and um <laughs> but once once I had accepted Jesus like it was this immediate warfare for me. Like <clears throat> I was having I would get pinned in bed at night, like things would get on top of me and pin me in bed. I would have voices that would tell me to kill myself. I would hear just like chanting at me when I go on the water. I would have like these wars, like whenever I'm trying to do tournaments, it's like when I'm trying to do my profession, um, I, would ha I had a voice tell me if I, if I, renounce Jesus that everything would stop like I mean and and please if you've never <laughs> watched this before I'm not psychotic I'm not like these are demonic things going on um yeah. just really really bad stuff and it got worse and worse um and I started just battling like suicidal urges voices telling me stuff um by the time, so I had accepted Jesus, I think around in August of 2021. And by December of 2021, I was just suffering. Like, I would go try and go to church. Um, I was trying to go to churches, which are big, is hard for me. A lot of things trigger me in there. And I would leave church and I'd start having like these murder visions, like just these graphic murder visions. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, I just went to church and I'm literally just like trying to drive away from church. And I have like two screens and like there's a murder going on. And I'm like, I don't understand what is happening. Like, this is scary. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, I'm just have I'm go was going through a lot of stuff. I thought maybe it's just like PTSD because I've had 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 in my twenties had some PTSD, and I thought, well, this is just like P I'm having PTSD. I'm having like emotional flashbacks or something. Something's going on because I'm waking up in the morning. I'm starting to wake up in the morning into just like this raw suffering this raw pain and not understanding like what I'm feeling and why I'm feeling it. Like I wake up into it. Um, and, uh, and then I had a nightmare and, and I had sent you, I, you can show it in a little minute. I sent you a thing about, about Shriners, but I, at the time I didn't know about this stuff, but I had this nightmare and in this nightmare, um, I was walking in the dark and I was going from house, this house where these people were supposedly my family, these group of people, but they weren't my family. And I'd walk in the dark down the street and like, I would feel like my, like my body was dying and I would look and like the blood is starting to like pool in my feet and look like, like I'm a corpse and stuff. And I, and I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to die. I need help. And I, um, it's like my throat's going to swell shut and I'm going to die and all this stuff. Like, it's weird. Like my body was dying while I'm walking. And so I went to another house and supposedly these people were my family and I didn't know them. And they say they're my family. And I'm like, but I need help. And they wouldn't help me. And so then I walked further 
and I get to another house that and they say that they're my family and and but they won't help me and they're saying they're gonna help me but they won't help me <laughs> and some some of them, one of them had like a flip phone and so I get the flip phone and I dial to try and get help that I'm dying and this van shows up that says they're gonna take me to the hospital and so I get in the van and um I end up in a field and I'm like laying on the ground in this field and then the corner is like this sort of half wooded and it's at night and there's these men by like firelight and they're digging a, a pit and some sort and they're like big in a pit and like a tunnel and some sort of like doing some sort of ritual and I see like this vortex of light there and I feel like this is Jesus is on the other side in the light and like he's trying to get to me but it's like taking time and these these people know it and and I'm just like I need Jesus and this person comes and says they're going to come and take me to see the doctor now and I'm like there's no hospital this is not the no one's see, taking me to see the doctor like there's no doctor and I started yelling like I just need Jesus and and they grabbed me by my feet and started dragging me and I'm like clawing in the dirt and screaming like I need Jesus and I'm screaming Jesus and they drag me underground and I'm in this room and there's a man there who is not a man and who is the doctor and he has like taupe skin and he has jet black hair and he has black eyes like there's no white in his eyes they are all black and he starts talking to me in like this foreign language that is like bouncing off my ears and I can't understand what he is saying at first and I see the vortex of light again and I told him I don't need you I just need Jesus and then he's then I start he's talking in this language and then I understand what this language is I can understand what he is saying to me even though it's like some other language and he like looks at the vortex and he and he turns around and he goes well you're going to die. And I'm just going to see if we can't hurry this along. And he goes to my feet and he starts stripping away the flesh on my feet. And all I see is just like strips of flesh and bone. And, and I'm screaming for Jesus. And he like cut into my leg and I feel all the blood and I can smell all the blood. And, um, and I see the I could feel like the flip phone in the blood and I call my friends and it's a voicemail and I just like tell them like I'm underground and no one's going to find me and I'm going to die down here. And this man is he is killing me and I just want Jesus and I want you to know I know I accept Jesus and I need Jesus, but no one's going to find me in time. <clears throat> and then I woke up. This is my <laughs> this is my dream. And. when I woke up from that dream, like, I just knew, like, this is not PTSD. Like, all this stuff I'm going through, this is something very evil and demonic, because that was very real. Like, I felt it all. Um, And that black, I call him the black guy, dude. <laughs> the black guy, dude, demonic dude, like, he would torment me he would like come at me at night and talk and talk at me and stuff. Like it was like a torment um, with the black eyed dude. And I realized like, I got this feeling like I need to get baptized. So I was like trying to figure out um, how to get baptized. Like, and I'm a new Christian. I'm just like, uh, I don't, I don't know what to do. I've been traveling everywhere. I'm like, can I, can I just baptize myself and just go out on my kayak in the middle of winter to jump in a lake and call. Yeah. I was just, gonna, you know, I went to a church to ask to get baptized and the guy started talking to me and I saw like the shadow go across his face and he said, no, he wouldn't baptize me. And I'll try to go get baptized in another church and they didn't have a bat. Finally, I ended up in church in Texas that I'd gone to said they would baptize me. And, um, and so I drove down there to Texas and I got baptized there in a horse trough. <laughs> and I think I sent you a picture of that, but my friends, my friends were there too. And they helped baptize me 
in that horse trough and stuff. Yeah. Is it that? That's it. That's it. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, like, uh, that's right before I got dumped in uh, Tommy's on the left and Cody's on the right. And um, Tommy went to push me in and like my body wouldn't move. <laughs> like, he tried to push me in my butt, like it locked and wouldn't go. So I just dumped myself into the back of, bottom of that horse trough. I just like shoved myself down in that horse trough. Um, Did you feel the resistance too? Or was it just him that felt it? I don't, well, he felt it because he pulled his hand away. And then I was like, oh no, no, we're doing this. Like <laughs> I, I just launched myself into the bottom of that thing. But, um, but when I came up, like, I thought, like, this baptism would fix everything and I would feel something or whatever. But I actually came up. I was not OK when I came up. I was I got sick. I wanted to throw up everywhere. I could hardly walk. I, they had tables back there and I there had a buffet going on. And people brought all this potluck food like I couldn't eat. I couldn't even hold my head up, really. And um and they tried to do, Tommy had tried to run me through some deliverance. And I remember he looked in my eyes, like, and I, everything was just blurry. Like, I just was not okay. And I don't think the deliverance had touched on much because I got like 10 minutes down the road. And I had a voice tell me, like, I could kill myself and go to heaven now because I was baptized. And that just, like, freaked me out. like. I was still not okay. And so the next day my friends came over and um, we did, we did a, a deliverance session about the black guy dude and, and got rid of that guy. Thank you, Jesus. Like got rid of that guy, but things were still happening, right? It just still happening. And like, what is going on? Like, I've like done all this stuff. Like everything has seemed to like got worse. It feels like it should be like popcorn and kitties and glitter and <laughs> oh. and like Jesus revolution or something like <laughs> it's it's not that way. Um, and that's really where my journey began because I said, well, you need to ask Holy Spirit um, to reveal what is hidden. I'm like, okay, like. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. I will ask that. And, and I prayed and he, um, and you gotta understand, like, I'm not schooled in the Bible. I, I was just learning, you know, like less than six months. Um, he told me, um, two things like, and he told me fairly fast he said, and he, I saw a vision of it when he told me, which is the weird, like, I was like, what the heck? But he had told me that my great grandfather had used me in rituals and and sold me to bail or ball or something for, for power. And I'm like, okay. And, and he told me that my tattoo that I had gotten, um, that was in my family coat of arms and my crest and everything to bind me to a thousand years of my ancestry and bloodline. But problematic. <laughs> That's what he said. Problematic. Um, and so I'm like, what is this? Like, what do you mean my great grandfather? Like I had one memory of him. Um, I think I sent you a picture. It's like a sepia tone. Like he was, Sort of a young curly hair guy. Um, I only had, I had met him. I had a memory of him really is when I was maybe like four. What? But that's. Was this Charles Wilson Peel? Is that him? No, it's a. No, that's, that's my fourth time great grandfather. Okay. I see another so, one that looks sort of sepia and it's at Stonehenge. Is that the one where you're sitting on the rock? Uh, no, that's my, <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I should label oh, things. Okay. I should label Wait. things better. Um, I should label things better. 
No, you're good. We'll find it in here. There's not too many crazy. Um, it's okay. Kate and Desert with Grandpa. No, I I will I will look while I'm talking to you. But I'm I thought I'd sent it, but maybe I didn't. It was a lot. <laughs> this is a lot to to unpack and stuff. But you know, I didn't I didn't know anything about like the that there's issues with Masonic. Or anything else like that. I'm just looking to see if I actually did send it. I may I'm I may not have sent that, but that's okay. I don't think I did. Strike that sorry, Emma. Okay. I, I Rick rolled you. I didn't mean to. Or grandpa rolled you. Um <laughs> uh but anyways, um so I'm like, what is this? Like I don't even, I didn't know like that stuff was even in the Bible. Like this just sort of started my journey of like, what do you mean I've been used in rituals? Like what, what is this? And with all the like spiritual attacks, I thought, you know, I need some help. And, and I started trying to see a counselor and stuff to try and just, I thought maybe I was just sexually abused. <laughs> like I thought I was just you know, I had issues in my life where I just couldn't be with people and stuff. And I thought there's something wrong with that. Most of my life, I just never dealt, like wanted to know. <laughs> and I thought, well, maybe this is just it. Like, I had no idea what I was really like dealing with. Um, but that's sort of where my journey and I, and I, that sort of started unraveling um my family the like everybody is a masonic my great grandfather was like the whoop de doo head dude of the scottish rite the one that used me in rituals and in, in, down in southern california and um him the one i did tell you he so he's like direct descendant to charles wilson peel so they're just mason like my great grandfather grandfather Great grandfather, great, 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 all the Masons, all the women, Masonic, you know, Order of the Eastern Star when they had it, everybody on both sides. And as I've learned with my family, like they both sides knew each other. <laughs> they knew each other. And so, like the Charles Wilson Peel, that my my fourth time great grandfather, um, He's Masonic. So like you look up, they'd even have him in like like famous Masons that were born. He was in, in the Yeah, that's that's him. Uh he was a famous painter involved in the revolution. He had our first one of the first museums. Um he was a, a believer of the Enlightenment <laughs> and uh one of the few our first museum really in America. Peel Museum. So he would get the, like the stuff from Lewis and Clark and they would um, preserve it and show it off in the museum. And he was best pals with, he like painted George Washington like 60 times or something. Uh, Benjamin Franklin. I mean, all the founding fathers, they were all pals. My, my great grandfather was like best pals with Thomas Jefferson. But And so the museum was named after him. Yeah, he opened it. He had, <laughs> it was sort of the first thing trying to show, like, I don't know, the evolution of things, <laughs> you know. Yeah, this talks about one of the paintings he did of Peyton Randolph in his Masonic sash and jewels and accoutrement for the lodge, you know. So he was painting all these founding fathers and their stuff when all their Masonic stuff. And so it was like his sons doing the same thing. Like his sons have their paintings in the Scottish Rite Museum. So it's, it's sort of, for me, it's been understanding like the stuff that I've had memories of um has been a, a multi-generational thing that goes way way back 
it goes way back on on both sides yeah do you, um and i can read it to you do you yeah. want to read this for people who might be listening on apple or spotify and don't oh, yeah. so it said charles wilson peel painted a full-length portrait so a full-length portrait <laughs> that's the whole guy standing there of Peyton Randolph in the Masonic Sash and Jewels and other accoutrement of the Masonic Lodge of Williamsburg, of which he was named the Grand Master in 1774. The portrait was destroyed by a fire, thank you, Jesus, at the library, well, I guess it was at the Library of Congress, so maybe not so good, but I'm okay with the painting. <laughs> Randolph was later elected the first president of the Continental Congress, and multiple smaller versions of his portrait were commissioned from Peel following his death in Philadelphia in 1775. Do you know what degree he was in Freemasonry? No. No. There he is. I mean, you can go on the website and they have like when he was born, when he died on the actual like Masonry <laughs> website. How long did it take you to figure this piece out to where you started Googling and, and had you ever heard of Freemasons before this or did you have any? Yes. Like I, all I, like I had known the Freemasons, like all of my family were Freemasons, but I didn't have memories of what happened yet. You know, like I knew the these context. things. Yes. I didn't have a con. And this is on my, so you see Thomas Jefferson. This is my other side of my family. So Charles Wilson Peel is like best buds with Thomas Jefferson <laughs> and, and painting Thomas Jefferson. In fact, if you look on the nickel, if you look at the nickel, the Thomas Jefferson nickel is based on the portrait that was done by by um Rembrandt Peel, which was was my like great 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 uncle. Um mm -hmm. but you know, so Thomas Jefferson's grandma was was relatives so um it's sort of creepy yeah so this is I okay so I know you're gonna link this book there's a book that's really helped me dealing with the Freemasonry stuff and I recommend it not just SRA survivors but anybody that has Freemasonry um in their lineage um it goes through it obviously isn't going to go through the abuse that happens, but it does go through what they do and all these different rites, what they do and the, um, the, the curses that they put upon themselves. Should they talk upon their generations, the oaths they take, the covenants they take, the, that they're not worshiping Jesus, what they're actually worshiping, all the stuff is in this book. And it goes step by step, sort of everything that they do and their rituals. And then has some great prayers at the end that I really highly recommend. Um, they're long, but they go through and renounce all these different oaths and covenants. So like that one you had with the Shriners, this is what tripped me out when I started going against this, um, the Shriners, and I'll just read it. It says, I renounce the oaths taken and the curses, iniquities, and penalties involved in the ancient Arabic order and the nobles of the mystic shrine. I renounce the piercing of the eyeballs with a three-edged blade, the flaying, and understand these are like, this is what they speak upon themselves and take oaths upon themselves that will happen to them and to their generations. I, ren uh, I renounce the piercing of the eyeball with a three-edged blade, the flaying or the scouring of the feet. That just tripped me out because I had a dream of getting my feet flayed by demon the madness and the worship of the false god allah as the god of our fathers i renounce the hoodwink the mock hanging the mock beheading the mock drinking of the blood of the victim the mock dog urinating on the initiate initiate and the offering of urine as a commemoration so it goes all these prayers that go through all these different things and, I, and it's really a way to to break that chains a bondage that have happened multi-generationally because this affects you know the the wives and daughters and granddaughters of masons <laughs> are you so still did, there yeah did you do these prayers on yourself what was your experience yeah, so i will tell you like when i first got this book i started 
I started using these because when I got this book, I and and I started to have memories come back. I was having a big problem with symbols in of Masonic symbols. So here I am like dry. So I was in Texas and I go to a courthouse with a friend and they have this cornerstone out in front with all these Masonic symbols on it. And I like looked at that cornerstone and by the time I got up to the top of the floor where we we're supposed to go, I was not okay. I was like spinning. I wanted to throw up. Like I had this intense reaction. I was not okay. And, and finally, like I sort of passed out in my friend's trailer. Like I just kept going downhill for hours and it couldn't like what happened with just like this, these symbols. And so I actually took these prayers and said all these, like, I renounced them myself and went up to that cornerstone and just anointed it and said, this is a rock. <laughs> this is a kingdom of God. And this is a rock. This is not some like unholy Masonic, you know, demonic cornerstone or portal or anything like this is a rock now. <laughs> and, and I anointed it in the name of Jesus as, as you know, not this Masonic stuff. Um, so that was sort of my first um, foray into that. But what I found was like, you really need to say these prayers with another strong Christian. Because I think when I'm trying to say them and I've got parts coming out, I think parts blocked me in some of them. Like, <laughs> like I'm thinking like maybe I said them all, but maybe I didn't. So I think it helps to have sort of a battle buddy in that to help you. And where two or more are touching something, there it shall be, right? And I just, I know that to have that with somebody else, that's a big deal. So, but I have used that, um, I've used that um, also against the Lodge. Holy Spirit had me, when I was driving through Laramie, he said, I want you to go and anoint the Lodge in Laramie, Wyoming. And this is where my, my great-grandfather and my grandmother was born in Laramie. My great grandfather was had been come across and was in Wyoming at the time. So he was involved in that lodge. And um it's really Holy Spirit. <laughs> like so I prayed up and, and went and I said all these prayers in front of that lodge, and the Masons are coming out. And the, Mas the Masons are coming out, and I'm praying over the Masons in the parking lot as they're coming out, and this one guy left. And he drove around the block and came back and stopped at my car. And um, and he's like, sort of like started saying to me, and I felt like he's like trying to trigger me or see what was going on. And then he said, well, one of us better be good and it's not going to be me. And then he drove off. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay, well, I'll, I'll pray for you, buddy. So when they all left... You know, I just kept saying those prayers and renouncing my what my great grandfather had done there, what my family had done there, as as I feel like I have a foothold in that as far as my bloodline and the and the Masonic rituals that were done to me. Um and the programming that happened to me that that I can have an effect in that way. And I went and I, I said that against everything in that to and went and anointed that thing and it's the kingdom of God in Laramie, Laramie Wyoming. But oh girl, um, you know, That's yeah. Amazing. And for people listening, the book is called Unmasking Freemasonry, Removing the Hoodwink. Mm -hmm. And it's by Silwyn R. Stevens. Mm -hmm. I think I said that right. That's kind of an yeah. I think they like J Jubilee Ministries International or something like that puts it out there in New Zealand, but um, on they Amazon, go through, yeah, you can get it on Amazon or you can download it digitally. Um, on Kindle, um, nine ninety nine. Yeah, yeah, and and it's been very helpful for me in in coming against that. Um, and you thing is the thing I like about it is you don't know necessarily what everybody's been into, you know, because yeah, people don't talk and they keep secrets. But like I knew my grandfather was a shriner. I think I sent you like his car, like pictures of his cards. Even yeah, 
That's my grandfather. That was his free and accepted Mason's card. He's a master Mason. And then I think you got the other ones in there. That's his Shriners for the Al Malaki Temple. Um, and the Shriners, you have to be 32nd degree, I believe, and be invited. And it's 32nd degree Scottish Rite to be invited. And by the time you're up there, like, you know, you're worshiping Lucifer. And like, so if he's a master, that's 32nd or is that 33rd? The master, the master Freemason is third degree. You have okay. to be 32nd to get into the Shriners. And I think it'd be show 32nd Scottish Rite. So if you show his Scottish Rite one. Next. Was this one. Yeah. Yeah. So that shows he's a 32nd degree Scottish Rite. Oh, my goodness. And then there's a little 33 down here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So much yeah. stuff on these. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. So, do you still have these cards? Were these? Yeah. Okay. Holy Spirit told me to hold on to those, and I never knew why. So I guess I get to use them now. Um, because I tried. I think I sent you like his a lot of his pins and stuff that he had. Um, yeah, like right there, you can see like all his. He's got all these different lodge pins for this and that, and Shriner pins and everything else. Um. And I got rid of, I got rid of all that stuff. Like it, that was really, to me, like cursed items that I did not want. I don't blame you. Yeah. Those, there's so many too. Mm -hmm. Was there one more photo with this series? No, that's a different one. No, yeah. that's my, that's my grandfather. That's my great grandpa on my dad's side. So, um. Yeah, they're all Freemasons. And the thing was, like, there's my family crest. They even have it on their tent. This is, like, turn of the century, you know? <laughs> like. Interesting. Yeah. The family, the genealogy is, like, a big deal. Um, And I know that they're, they, that they're brotherhood. They're a brotherhood. So, so for me, it's just, it's. It's just a confirmation of understanding of like what I'm dealing with when I'm coming against this, like, you know, the memories that I have of rituals and the things that I haven't been involved in, you know, as, as Holy Spirit is bringing them back and I'm, and I'm experiencing them, it's, it's intense. And the programming that I've gone through is intense. And it's like, this is stuff I was never meant to get out of. Yeah. I can see how far back it goes. And it's beyond the founding of this country. And that's some serious, deep, dark, generational stuff. And and it it helps me sort of deal with like why why did this happen to me and why is my family and and for like my folks who I haven't gone there with them like I have a lot of compassion in my heart for them because I feel like they are no different than me it's just that they are 81 and haven't ever come out of it and I just want them to get to know Jesus and be saved and as I'm not saying that there isn't accountability but, like, how did I get out of it? For all intents and purposes, I should still be being handled and getting reprogrammed and tuned up and doing whatever was. And, and now I'm going through, like, dealing with programming and dealing with this just mind control and, and the memories that are horrific that are coming out and just asking Jesus like for healing and he is healed he has been so faithful in that you know like he has been so faithful in this process but it is so difficult and so isolating and you don't know what is happening to you and to understand like the significance of 
this isn't just like some random I got picked up by some dude in a van or something like that. Like this was plotted and planned is a bloodline thing that I was never meant to get come out of. And for God's grace and mercy, he has rescued me out of it. And here I am. And so that's why I feel like I need to talk about this um, and share this because I know I'm not the only one. And it's only and it's only through through Heavenly Father that I'm being rescued from this. And I want my I want my family that my blood family that is still alive to be rescued, but they are not awake and they are not my mom sometimes does. My mom, I think both my folks, and granted, I'm saying this, this is <laughs> This is me. Like, I'm just saying this with my name out there. What happened to me? And, you know, maybe my family will see this and get and things will happen. But, like, I have compassion for them because I feel they are just as programmed multiple as I am. And that they dissociate. And I've experienced that. And my mom will tell me stories of things of my grandparents and my mom will say she has told me about rituals that she has had through like Job's daughters and all these different things that she will tell me or she'll say I'm waking up at 3 a.m and I'm like really upset and I don't know what's going to happen to me and like all this stuff like this stuff is sort of breaking loose in her but like it's just like it doesn't stick like she's not you know I I think Jesus is the only way and I I don't expect like my parents at 81 to go through this kind of healing process. Like, this is hard. I just want them to not end up in the lake of fire. You know, like. Yeah, it's, it's really easy to dehumanize and villainize. And again, there does need to be accountability. You know, what what's happening behind the scenes in these systems is unspeakable and it's horrific, you know, like there has to be some type of accountability, but we do forget that in passing that these, all of these adults were all innocent children. They were all born innocent and they were corrupted and they were tortured and they were, they were made and programmed to be evil, you know, the most pure type of evil. And that, like you said, you to should, do, have and, to, and to do things and not remember them obviously yes okay because yes. i can say here like i have memories i have memories of doing horrible things that i just make me want to throw up not just you know like i have memories of being forced to kill in rituals i'm and Lisa Meister did a baby did a baby memorial, and I put up a name in there because I knew the name. I knew the boy's name was Emilio. I knew his name, and I I was forced to just plunge a knife into him, and I killed him. I don't. All I know is his name was Emilio, and I have that on my soul. I have these things that have happened. I have parts in me that are trained in ways that are just horrendous. How am I any different than my folks? I'm just I'm just 30 years younger and I found Jesus and he is healing me and he is washing me clean. And my sins are forgiven and I'm trying to pay back and trying to talk about this and talk and bring this to light about what is happening in every part of our country under the guise. And I'm not, I'm not just say like you hear it and I'm going to say it too, that lower level Freemasons are probably just clueless. They are a funding source. They are an absolute pocket funding source and a PR front. They're like the pretty glitter on the glove that covers a really evil hand. 
and they're in every community. You go to like you go down here to get to the get your tags for your truck, and they're selling Shriner candy bars and everything else because they think Shriners do good, right? But they do not. At the very top levels, they know exactly what they're doing. And they know exactly who they're worshiping. They're worshiping Lucifer. They're trafficking children. They're killing children. They're raping children in rituals and summoning demonic into them. They're breaking them into pieces and becoming program multiples. They're using mind control. Our government uses has used. It's all over the place. Because we're in a war. We're in an absolute war. We're in a spiritual war with evil right now. And they aren't even hiding it anymore. They are hiding it anymore. Cause you know, so but it's there. And and I am a survivor of that. And I have to like people like Faye Russell talked about. <laughs> she's the only person like I that part that that part of me that ritually killed Emilio had a name that <laughs> this is really hard for me to say that part actually went by a name a sheriff's blade and I was like what is this name <laughs> when this name come I'm like I don't even know what this is but this is a name and I didn't even know it because the part told my friend who is also a survivor and she showed me they wrote it down like i'm surprised that even happened so i'm just like i don't even know what this is and, you know and then i find the bible like the sheriff's polls asher's polls or whatever and then faye russell i watch her podcast and she's talking about the horrific abuse by the masonic members that she endured and she talks about a part that is that is dealt is being controlled by a the by the demon Asherah. And I'm like, me. This is the only person I have heard say the exact same name of something. And for me, like that's why I feel like it's so important for me to share what I experienced because. Because you're in it by yourself and it's so isolating. And that what happens to you, like for me, like as I have learned in this process is that I have, I have been manipulated since birth, maybe since before birth, as far as my attachment to caregivers. Like everything is designed to break you, to, 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 fracture you into parts that will be usable for purposes of evil men, evil women, my 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 ancestors, my family, cult brotherhood, you want to call it Illuminati, Brotherhood, Masonic, like they're all in the same circles. And that they do this for for power. Just straight out power. Because there is power in the blood that gets spilled. And that is why Jesus, when he died for us, when he died for us, he took all of our sins and he was that blood sacrifice because the power is in the blood. And the and the enemy mimics everything. And so they there is power in that. But it is power that that they are so deceived thinking that it will lead somewhere, but it will not. It will lead to internal damnation of your soul. And it and it's fueled by the torture and rape of children, the trafficking of children. And those children then become used and get programmed and used for whatever cult jobs that you will have. And it just goes on and on. And it's a protection of of blood especially the bloodlines and and i thought 
And I have to be fair, like, I thought I hear people talk about bloodlines and stuff. I'm like, that's such a baloney. Like, there's just no way. Well, like, I, and this, I said this knowing my ancestry and knowing that I have tattoos on me, dedicating me to and tying me to a thousand years of my bloodline. And I still thinking, like, this is complete baloney and you know let me just get my tinfoil and and protect my brain from aliens or whatever like yeah like I thought like that didn't mean anything and so when I had gone through um like I'd done all the Masonic prayers like I feel like each time it's like a layer in a battle so I went through all the Masonic trying to break the the oaths and and things that tied me on the Masonic and then it's like, what other legal access? So I just did all this other prayer work on removing legal access because I'm still having problems. It's like you get through this and then it's like this other layer, this other layer comes off and it's just unraveling. And, and then I, we got down, uh, we did like this, this legal access stuff and um, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Holy Spirit just goes, he goes, Merovingian. And I'm like, what is that? Is that like from a movie? <laughs> is that like from a movie? Like, come on, Holy Spirit. Like, is this like, and then I'm like, is this really Holy Spirit telling me this? Like, am I getting like, <laughs> is this happening to me? Am I like, is this for real Holy Spirit? And he's just poking me, Merovingian. Mer talk to Sarah. So I go talk to my friend and um, and I'm like, look. Holy Spirit is poking me really hard with a stick. And I don't even want to say the name. Like, I don't even want to say it because it sounds like crazy and like from the Matrix or like, you know. But I'm going to just tell you, like, he said this and that we should do this, this legal, do all these prayers that we just spent like hours doing and battling and going through all this stuff like for that. So we started doing it and I'm just thinking like, I must do it, be obedient. This is a bunch of whatever. <laughs> In the middle of the prey, like my arms just exploded. Like I got just welts and everything all over my arms. And that has been something that's been occurring in in different parts of my journey with body memories and like histamine responses, which I'm learning to understand is probably also programmed. Um and I think I sent you some pictures. I can tell you some stories of it. Like there's one. But that was validating to me. Like stuff got stirred up in a big way. And I'm like, I can't believe this is real. Like, I can't believe this is happening. Um, yeah, so I get a lot of stuff on like on my hands. Like my hands will just like blow up and I will have um, blisters and stuff that have shown up on my fingers I've had yeah that's one where you can see like everything is just red and angry um yeah and I take pictures of them because this is a messed up picture but this is some of the stuff like I I woke up um and and this had happened and these blisters like I like the skin just came off of all of it so it was really painful but um yeah or that one is actually i was um i was in a church service and my hand just started hurting i hadn't done anything my hand just started hurting and we've been i've been having prayers from other people we we're praying on me my hand just started hurting and i just like bruises appeared that's just they just appeared i didn't do anything it's just in front of other people um and so, yeah, it's some messed up my eye. Yeah, I mean, it looks like I got clobbered. <laughs> this one, um, actually, this one, I think I sent you like a little picture of like a one year old. Uh, keep going. There's a one that's like Katie at one one years old. Oh, oh, maybe it's another. You could go back. Hold on. Um, Go back here. Yeah. The, the, 
Katie, one year old. Kate, one year old. Yeah. Um, is... Up on the right corner is like a little that one. Yeah. So like um, one of my first body memories was I was talking with my counselor about this picture I had in my wallet. This was a picture that my grandfather had of me. I think it's me. It says my name and one year old. And uh, he had his wallet. And so I had it in my wallet. And I literally was talking to her just about the picture. And I looked down and these welts had appeared on my arm. And uh, that was sort of my, like, my first, my first, like, it just blew my mind. Like, how is it that I'm just talking about this, this little baby, baby me, and that stuff just appeared on my arm and it stayed for like a day and a half. It like started out as these welts and then it became these red, like red cut scars on my arm and I will say that baby um when I was praying that is that is my first integration that child right there that child has been integrated in me and we were we were praying and um there's a holy spirit had talked to me to one of my parts and talked about had been talking about Joshua crossing the Jordan and talking about the, the promises of God that they would all cross the Jordan and that their feet wouldn't even get muddy, like they'd be crossing on dry ground. And when I was integrating this part, this part, I saw a vision of this part crawling across the Jordan River, crawling across, it had been pulled back and they're craw crawling across on dry ground across the Jordan River to Jesus. <laughs> That little, that little, that little one-year-old. Um, and that was, that part was integrated. Gosh, that's baby. You're so cute. Look at your little curls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cute. Should we show the other one to you with the, the oopsie picture? Do you want to talk about that? Sure. <laughs> Is that sort of along the same lines? Yeah. Um. And I know, like, I'm showing pictures because um, they're verifications and confirmations for me. And what this is, this is me on the left. And I hadn't noticed this picture till after I started healing, when I started looking at it. And I call it the oopsie picture because there's some stuff that's really, that's really wrong with it. Like, um, if you look at my legs, like... My legs are just like bruises upon bruises upon bruises. And I don't know if you can zoom in on it, but for me, it's just like, I feel like, like you can see them. They're like all over the place. And that's not normal. Like on my feet, my ankle, like all over under my knees. Um, That is like. That is a sign of really bad physical abuse right there. And and I have to tell you, like, I have no memory of where that is. I have no memory of that picture. I don't know where it was taken. Um, but that's, like, that's not okay. Like, I'm protecting my genitals, and I have bruises all over my legs. And for me, that's just... That helps me to know, like, this happened to me. There is photographic evidence of something very not okay happened to me. And uh, that just helps me because you question yourself so much. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And so many people don't have pictures. I've met a lot of survivors on the show, you know, their parents like lost all the photos or they had to stop talking to the family and the family had never given them photos on purpose or else the photos that they do have are all of the picture perfect family. Mm -hmm. It is very validating when you can get some sort of, some sort of visual verification and confirmation of those body feelings and even of you know, the, the emotional aspect of it. And, and 
I mean, this is very telling, you know, that's not normal. Like your entire everything is, it's like, you're just a giant bruise, Mm -hmm. you know, that's extremely validating, you know, one or two bruises, like kids get bruises, but this, this is not normal. And, 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 you know, and for me, I don't have outside of what memories have come to me. Like I have really a sea of amnesia for like most of my young life like this time period I don't know how old I was I'm gonna guess around six um I can't tell you who my teachers were or my friends were or anything like I have so much amnesia but I have a picture showing some really messed up stuff and I know it's me and it just helps me And maybe it'll help others to see what is, what goes on behind the scenes with in these in these uh in cults and stuff that's going on with that. So on those lines, yeah, let's, let's go back a little bit to when your memories started coming up. So you had found Jesus, you got baptized, you were starting yeah. to experience these very scary horrific dreams you were starting to feel yes. things on you and like you said the path kept getting darker even though you felt like gosh I'm going into the light why is everything like this happening it's so worse yeah like it. so take us down what happened next leading up to those the memories coming back I mean really it was a spiritual warfare and um I started talking to a counselor and just things started coming unraveling the counselor told me i had parts i didn't believe that i'm like what do you mean i have parts you're crazy you like, that? no like i'm like i i got so mad i was gonna fire her and <laughs> like really and so i called up my friends and i'm just like you are not gonna believe like what she just told me like i can't this made me so mad and they're like you have parts like we see it, we just been like not saying anything, but we see it, and yes, you do. And I'm like, okay, like I trust them. They knew it, you know. And granted, my friend is is also a survivor, so they been on this walk. They saw it, but I'm just like, you know, like the Rodney Dangerfield of like SRA survivors. <laughs> like I'm just running around, like no respect. I don't know what's happening. I'm bumbling around, and. I'm like, okay, you know, and I didn't, I didn't believe it. This is how this works. Like, I didn't believe it. And so I said, well, I don't, I feel like I know everything that's happening. And we had a discussion and and she said, well, you just got to just like, let go. Just like, it sounds weird, but just like, let go and like, let a part come out and talk or whatever. I'm like, this is nuts. Okay. try it and I had this conversation on the phone and I guess a part came out and but so like how how it worked for me was like I would think like it was a seamless conversation like five minutes let's say I'm just as an example but really what happened is it was an eight minute conversation right so I would hear this part and then there would be a part it's like cutting the tape recorder off to go, you know, off the record. So it'd be like this part of this discussion that I would have no memory of. And then I'd come back and I'd be discussing and there'd be another part. So so I would think I'm in this seamless thing, but I'm really completely amnesic to what was happening. But I thought it was all one thing. And it was only through like documenting it and going through this discussion and going, these are, this is what I said. And this is what I heard I say. And then my friend's like, this is what you said. And this is also what you said. And this is also what you said. And this is also what you said. And I'm like, I didn't say that. No, you did. Like it actually happened. And so then I could see, like, I can't, like, that just blew my mind that, that it was to me, I thought I had a seamless conversation. I never knew that there was this stuff going on with some other part 
and I'm completely amnesic and don't know it. And I'm just going on talking about whatever. And I didn't know like this other stuff happened. And, and just understanding the part stuff, like how that even happened. Um, I have a, I have a spinal cord stimulator in my body for that I had put in there because of some really bad pain in my spine um, from on a nerve. And so um, I had my friends had prayed on me and I had gotten healed from that, but I still had like, thank you, Jesus, like took the pain away where I didn't have to have the program, the program running at all, but I would keep charging it just in case, like, is this really healed? <laughs> like, is this really healed? You know? I don't want to hurt, whatever. And so I didn't take it, turn it off until Holy Spirit told me to turn it off. And I turned it off and I was fine. And like a few days in, then suddenly I just started hurting. And I'm like, what is this? I thought I was healed. Like, what is going on, Jesus? Like, can you take this pain away? And it wasn't taking it away. And it just got worse and worse. And it was excruciating pain. And I remember I was driving, I was trying to drive and I'm in this excruciating pain where I can barely breathe. And then suddenly I am outside of my body. I am over my shoulder watching myself drive and I don't feel any pain at all. I'm just watching myself drive and I don't feel any pain and I'm on over my right shoulder. And I, somehow I get off the road to like a gas station and I'm like, and then I'm back. And that's like, and I'm in pain. And I'm like, what the heck just happened? Right? What, what did I just experience? And, and Holy Spirit's like, this is what they did, how they did this to you. Like you, they'd get you in so much pain. You break off, you break off. And I experienced it. I just dissociated right out. Is it so much pain? Just dissociated right out. My body's going down the road with, I don't know what part was driving me down the road, but like me, I'm out. I'm out, boy. And I'm just watching myself drive and I feel no pain at all. And that is just, and that, then it's like I started to understand like the, what is going on with me? Like I have these parts these, and this is how they did this to me that they put me in so much pain. And once I had like that basis of like, this is real and I have parts and this is what happened. And I, and I had, at that time I had one memory, um, besides the one Holy Spirit giving me of a programmer that I know is David. And I know this from parts, apparently talking up to my counselor about David, um, because I would do counseling, I would show up for counseling and I don't know who ended it. Like I literally would be amnesic from my whole counseling session. Like I would have to like get the abbreviated version of my life later. <laughs> and uh, so, but I had one memory of laying on a table and um, this man was like on my right hand side and I'm like strapped down on a table and the lights are all on and I'm like in a room in some room that has like two foot high ceilings and it's like cream color yellow paint and he is wearing like a gold sort of almost like a satin like a gold shirt that has like a wide collar and has like a red sash around on a, on the arm for some reason He's, you know, got yellow blonde hair. He's wearing these glasses that sort of darken in the light. Not quite some, like, like light changing glasses. Must, yellow, blonde mustache. And when I've tried to draw him, I cannot draw him with just a mustache. Like, I have to draw with a beard. And I don't know why that is. But when I've drawn this, and, and my in my memory, like, he is standing right by me and, like, his junk is out. He's, <laughs> you know there and I'm looking at him and he is like surprised he is like looking at me surprised like I feel like I'm supposed to like not be awake I'm not supposed to be me um but like he's surprised and then he starts talking to some other people to tell him and then and they are playing um 
they're playing this carpenter song over and over and over and over. Like, <laughs> I mean, this sort of dates me, right? But they're but they're just fun. We've only just begun by the Carpenters, and please don't play it because it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, but that was like my first the first one that had come to me and then um and then parts parts started coming out um <laughs> parts started coming out after like the start of rolling and it's just like the sort of the slow progression then just kaboom like stuff just started coming unraveled i had parts coming out and um I had the Sashera's Blade, who by now is is renamed, chose a different name. <laughs> it goes by friend. And um, but at the time, um I was at a uh I was at um I was at a, <laughs> I don't really want to say where I was, but I will. I was at a a women's fishing conference, like a little get together group and it was very stressful for me because of just some other things in my life um but holy spirit told me to go there and i'm being obedient so i went there and i mean i was just struggling and parts are coming out and i was at the i was at the dinner table um and this is reported to me by my kind friend who was sitting next to me but uh, I was at a dinner table. Um, there was a man in front of me with his girlfriend. It was all women, but they had the men in there. And I guess he was play fighting with a knife. Well, my friend said that I was there with like the knife tucked up under me, under my arm, ready to like go at the guy, telling him that he is going to regret. Uh, well, why did she say the words were? This isn't going to end well for you. <laughs> or something like that yeah and uh this is so embarrassing <laughs> yeah so i had a very controlled um part that was ready to go and probably do some serious well-versed knowledge um because i feel like i'm uh i know i know i know how to do some bad things and uh um my friend politely asked for the knife <laughs> and i guess um went back took me uh back to my room and this part came out and and the room i think i got triggered because the room was very loud and there was all this cheering and this memory came forward of having to kill people and this cheering like this bloodlust cheering and that had triggered all this stuff but that part came to jesus and thank god for for my friend that could be there to accept jesus and learn that they could give up their job and have a new job and new names and be healed through jesus and so when that part of me came to know Jesus, then other parts were like, okay, well, friend, friend has done it like friend is strong. Like, okay, well, if friend could, then this is like something possible that I could do. So then other parts would come forward with memories. Um and and I have memories of um some terrible things like Especially ritual, some ritual, yeah, like, <laughs> so there's like a guy, I think I sent you a picture of Barracuda. Um, I had a part that had come out, uh, this part had come out in a counseling session, and I just know this from report, by the way, from my friends. I'm very lucky to have some very loving friends. Um, that guy was like my grandfather's like best buddy. Um 
and this part had come out in a session and my friends had come and driven this part home. Um, she had said her name was Cottontail, which was a CB handle. And she talked about Barracuda and this is Barracuda. Um, so I, I have a picture of this man because I have memories of him in rituals with other men and he was he was raping he was raping me in this ritual and he would say he said to this part be quiet like a rabbit be quiet like a rabbit and and i will say just me i know it's this part of me but i'll just say me like i was quiet she was quiet and at the end of this ritual um the, there were other children there that were crying because they were being hurt and she was quiet and the end of the ritual like and this is out in the desert by the way this is out like like it just blew blew me away at nathan reynolds was talking about havasu city because my family is like running between havasu city and in vegas out in the desert with this stuff and this is where barracuda is driving me around but he in this ritual and they um had duck they had a pit and they threw they like killed the other kids but didn't kill me but threw us all in the pit threw those other children on top um and i all i can guess is that i was quiet that i was quiet that and that's why i didn't die like Yeah, so <clears throat> Do you know how old you were at that time? Oh, I think uh, I'm not sure if Cotton Two is six, five, six. I'm I'm not sure. Somewhere around there. Um, but I have memories of that man driving me. Driving cocktail around in the desert. I have memories of being trafficked with other men in cars. I have memories of of <laughs> where I think a lot of some of this stuff happened um at uh at the Mission Inn in California where my family had a studio and all the big muckety mucks would travel through there as a massive hotel. Um, I have memories of being, um, of, of being raped in a room that had no doorknob on the inside, but it was all elaborate on the inside of this room. Like there was a design on the ceiling and it was just this old man doing stuff to me. And, uh, and all I can think is that it's there because I have memories of being, um, locked up there and i'm and locked up and so um, yeah <laughs> and so that was was it california nevada and mm -hmm. arizona was that sort of yeah, the areas? yeah yeah like california um into like outside of like Palm Springs, Palm Desert. There's some mountains up there that sort of resort areas. And then you go out into the Mojave and I have a lot of my memories of just really terrible stuff happen out in the Mojave Desert. And, and I have memories of, um, with David and stuff of like hunting people out there. I mean, it's just some messed up stuff that goes on out there in, I mean, how do you, how do you deal with all that? Because, and I guess that's all I want to say when to other people is like, when you're experiencing these things coming forth and you're experiencing just this messed up programming, like I will give you an example how messed up this is. Like, <laughs> besides just stuff showing up on my body and stuff like, uh, 
I had like screwed up. I screwed up royally with a friend with a friend and and I had hurt them and and I discovered that I had hurt them. I didn't mean to, but I had hurt them emotionally. Um and that just kicked off something in me because I have an attachment with them of like I was like devastated like like a life and death kind of devastation um and this part of me for about six hours was just saying i'm a bad dog over and over i'm a bad dog i'm a bad dog i'm a bad dog just like this chant i'm a bad dog i'm a bad dog and i had this like vision of something that i was having to eat like like thistles and like spiked seeds and and things like just that I was this bad dog and I and I know I have a part that has memories of like being like a hunting dog which is really messed up <laughs> but it's this kind of stuff where something clicks in and you're like what like you don't have control I don't have control of myself some part I'm like co-conscious at least i'm not completely amnesic at this point i'm co-conscious but i don't have complete control and they are chanting i'm a bad dog over and over and over and over and feeling like they're gonna die and it's like this programming or i've had um in session with my coach and she there's things i'm still discovering and unraveling and she asked something like because I knew I had been forced to kill. And she had asked me when my last mission was. And I sort of like, how am I supposed to know that? And then like something happened with me. And I completely lost it. Like inside was like an avalanche. And the memories, like I can't even grasp the memories. They're like, at the time it was like an avalanche. I couldn't even like keep all the memories and now when i try and focus on them i can't see them it's like i'm blocked but but at the time it was like this avalanche and i couldn't even get words out couldn't talk and the, and the only thing that came out of my mouth was um some phrase it was a phrase that i kept saying over and over of i mean where does this come from i it was a uh, good men come to the aid of their country saying that over and over i mean this is some messed up stuff like you think you gotta be like completely whacked but like i can't control this and i and i started having this bodily pain i ended up on the floor and like my muscles are all like tightening and cramping and having these convulsions and i'm in this horrible pain because of one question like this, I have one question and in this complete like freak out reaction in programming kickoff. And in, in in the net I was there at that I was at my rental house. I was at my rental house for two days. I was completely non-functional for two days. Like I got suicidal. I tried to be functional and like go move a box down the stairs. And I'm something about moving this box and open the stairway to the basement and looking down the stairs and moving this heavy thing I flipped out I just completely started sobbing and I felt all this physical pain it's like I have the emotions and the physical pain but not the memory and you came and figure out like what is going on and then you got like suicide programming kicking off and you feel so isolated and how do you like ask for help when you and ask somebody for help when you can't even tell them what's happening to you right it's just jesus like like you call out to jesus and sometimes that just physically like physically is so hard because you want like some other person to be, know what's happening to you and to be there and to understand and you are alone you know and i know jesus can heal but like it makes such a difference for survivors if you can at least you don't have to know what to do or even understand what's happening but like be be with them 
in the most uncomfortable experience ever, really. Like, what are you supposed to do if somebody's on the floor, like, flipping out and hurting and can't talk and can't explain why they're, like, sobbing and can't make words and has memories coming out and, you know, like, it's some messed up stuff and it's a miracle and only by Holy Spirit that that the healing that we get through Heavenly Father that we make it out of that because there's so isolating and they do stuff to you to cause like they do that to you to cause it. I've had issues with attachment that you know I've my my friendships right now are essentially my coach is like my first friendships outside of the cult and I'm completely clueless on how to have like a healthy friendship right. I'm completely clueless and I screw up all the time and the programming kicks off and I'm a hot mess and all this, like when my friends would leave, like I had these attachment to them and it actually became like a physical pain. It was like this programming and a physical pain where like it hurt my body so bad. Like I wanted to end the friendship with them and go back with my family to make the pain I was in stop. And that's like, that's why I think it's so hard for people to get free because you you literally have to go through that and go against it and come out the other side to try and break that experience. You know, and and then you throw in astrals and everything's crazy. <laughs> Can you talk about that? Because that's that's been brought up a lot and it's really validating, I think. The more people that can talk about these things you know, it validates it for everybody else. Um, again, this goes in the category of things I thought were complete baloney and didn't apply to me. Yeah. We're not taught this stuff. I, um, like, again, I'd done all the Masonic stuff. I'd done all the spiritual legal access and I was running into something that happened. Like, I'd done all this prayer work and I thought like mountains had been moved and chains had been broken and thank you, Jesus. And then there comes this other thing, <laughs> you know, and I was in, I was in session with my coach and she was praying and I started laughing and I couldn't control it. Like laughing at Jesus, laughing at her like a mocking laugh and my friends have said they've heard this mocking laugh before and they have thought maybe it's a demonic or a part but like it was not demonic because you can bind you can separate soul and spirit and you can bind the demonic and you could kick them out right you can get rid of the demonic because we have authority in jesus's name over that with a part you know, that's flesh. We have to do a little more work in parts and you got to have some healing for parts and stuff. And you can ask Jesus to sequester parts that are causing problems, um, you know, to try and give you, some, you know, and have him bring things out in his time and ask him to sequester them. But this was neither. Like, what is this going on? And, and my coach is like, I think this is like astral stuff. So I'm like, I don't know what this <laughs> this is. What do you mean? You know, and I tried to start learning about it and we got some prayers to like deal with the astral stuff. Because um, for instance, I was having astral taking me over where I couldn't control it, like even my body. And I'm conscious of it. It's not the same as co-conscious, and I'm fighting it. And, um, like I was trying to text, write a text. My coach had written a text trying to help me in my relationships because I'm sort of boneheaded. And so she had written it out, trying to help me <laughs> navigate this. And so I'm trying to text and this laughing starts. This laughing starts and I'm fighting with my fingers to type. Like I'm trying to type this and then my fingers are going and hitting like the emojis with like 
bad emojis, like putting in emojis, wanting to type bad things. And it's just like this constant battle. And then she's like, you need to screenshot me right now what you were t- what you were typing, you know? And I'm trying to screenshot and I can't control my fingers and screenshot it. And And this was astral. This was an astral projection into me. And we came against that in prayer. And and like when we were praying, like like it was this mocking. I can't even I can't even describe it, but it is an actual real thing. It is an actual real thing. And I had to come against it in prayer and 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 I continue to pray on that, that parts cannot astral out and communicate. Parts cannot I cannot get astrals in that, that you know, like I know this sounds like all woo woo, but that is an actual real thing. And I've experienced it and it is very scary. It's some very scary stuff. But it's very real. There's been so many people. I've even had people come on my show and off camera tell me these things and say, I'm afraid people will think I'm crazy if I say this. I'm telling you because it's a part of my story. This happened to me. You know, there's a lot, I think, that gets misconstrued just because we're not taught it. You know, same thing with yeah. things like clairvoyance, um, things like uh, remote viewing. Like there are these abilities that exist that we aren't made aware of and when we do hear about them it's like in a marvel movie or it's in fiction you know so in our minds we think well that can't be real it was in it was in this movie that i watched and it was fiction it was in this book that i read you know that's only something that happens in harry potter you know and it's like we just have such a a lack of education on the capabilities that humans have and like this world that we live in, the spiritual aspect is really stripped from everything that we know. And we're just really focused on the physical aspect, you know, but that is very real. The spiritual side, I think is even more real than anything, you know, that we see and it's all around us. And most of us are just so unaware that it exists, you know, especially yeah. people who aren't believers, you know, they're just, they're just lost in this physical material world, you know, and, it's so much greater than that. And there's like a whole different realm that's around us all the time that most of us aren't even aware of, much less know how to defend ourselves from it, you know, because we're not taught it. And it's like, if you, if you're feeling something overcome your body, like, what do you do? Go on Google. What does this mean? You know, it's like, where do you even start? Yeah. It, you what, know? Is this, what is this creepy laughing thing that keeps taking me over and creeping everybody out? Like, <laughs> you know, it's not me and, and it's not a part and it's, not a demon it's i mean this is something and and you're right in that this goes along with really uh, and i'm not saying this in contemning in co- condemnation of the church i'm just stating it as what i believe from my own experience of, of watching is that there is holy spirit said to me my people My people suffer for lack of knowledge in that we aren't having our, we don't have the discernment going on in the body of Christ to see this stuff happening where churches have been infiltrated by witch covens and Masonic and everything else. That you have all this stuff. Everybody's bringing in stuff, but you have all this stuff that's been infiltrated, and and we have a body of Christ that isn't isn't necessarily always seen and taking action in their authority in the body of Christ to battle that. That they don't know that this battle is happening on around them. They maybe go to church once a week for an hour or something, and that's you know like a thing they do. And you look at the the occult and cult groups and there's a serious devotion and dedication that goes on for generations that they are intense in this and seeking that power like they're like um (laughs) you know they're 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 practicing in it and delving into these dark things in the spirit to gain power and, and use these things and we're behind a little bit in that and and assuming that because 
because we accept Jesus and we go get dunked, that it's all, all done. But it's not all done. We're in we're in the last days. And that and by saying it's all done, that's how it allows us to be blind to all the trafficking that is happening in this country, in this world, that we can be blind to the ritual abuse that's happened and say, oh, that's just some made up memories or something. Like this, this is rampant to the point that you ha you see it on media with the whole like um what was the name of that that fashion thing? But the Balenciaga. Balance, yeah. Say that again. Balenciaga. The Balenciaga. Like it's a normalization of stuff that is right in front of our eyes. And I'm just saying, like, for, as Christians, and our, we, we can't afford to be asleep at the wheel and be passive in this. Jesus wasn't passive. And Jesus wasn't just defensive. He didn't sit around and wait for the enemy to show up. You know, he didn't sit around in Nazareth and wait for, um, lepers and and people with demons in them to show up at his place in Nazareth like he was out and doing things he was on the offense and I really feel like our our brothers and sisters in Christ that we can put on our armor and we can lock shields together and we can open our eyes and ask for the discernment to help survivors and help children and open up to what is actually happening in our world and stand against it and be offensively praying. Prayer is an ICBM. You can pray against something on the other side of the world and it touches it in the spiritual. Right? We have a power of prayer that is stronger than anything. Heavenly Father is stronger than anything. The blood of Jesus is stronger than any blood covenant that the enemy does in any kind of ritual. We have that power, but we have to be wise and discerning and be able to step into it and know what we're seeing because it's in there. So even, I'm going to go there. So even, <laughs> even in my own church, like I talk about, I'll hear people go like, well, my, my grandfather was a 33rd degree Mason. Well, my, you know, like. My mother was was this or that, like, but they don't know that that level of Freemasonry, what that involves as a Luciferian worship level, and that those curses, those generational curses and things that have been passed down to them, right, that they can take that in their own life and come against that and, and free themselves from that. And they will start seeing and being able to help the other people who are in that, like we just have to step into it. And I think it's this whole thing of like people come in with problems is like, I come to church. I'm, I feel like I'm the weird lady at church. Cause I'll have problems with a lot of the services. Like our things trigger off on me, like with ritual stuff. And I'm still there and I'm trying my best, but like everybody comes in. There's people that come in with drug problems or come in like there's a there's freedom to be had and we have to step into it. And I just can you imagine they talk about the body of Christ and like the gifts of the spirit? Can you imagine a church that is operating in all the gifts of the spirit? What a powerhouse that would be. Can you imagine? I don't know. They could see everybody that comes in. Like, what? what is it that we can't, we can't have that? Why can we not activate that? Because the enemy, people are in witchcraft covens and trafficking children and raping and killing them for power and doing all this stuff in our in our country and around the world for generation after generation after generation like what what are you going to answer it with 
because it because the what the laws don't work because they're all up in there they're, <laughs> it's a system our whole country look at my own genealogy that i have just presented to you that my own ancestors involved in American Revolution are all involved in Masons. They are Masons. The founding fathers are Masons. They're painting pictures of Masons that are all in, in our Continental Congress. Like it is all founded. You can, I'm sure there's a billion videos to watch on YouTube about the Masonic connection. And they'll say that's all just conspiracy, but it, it is real is real. I am descended from it. I can prove it from my own lineage and I've suffered from it, but I'm being set free from it. Right? And I see it and I'm speaking it because this happens to other people. It's happening all over and people don't know because they go through it and they're amnesic and they're manipulated. They're manipulated and controlled and there's slaves, and they don't even know it. So, you're absolutely right. You know, we don't know. Sorry for the rant, my rant. <laughs> no, r please rant. You've had your whole life where you weren't able to rant because you didn't know. Like, we're so lucky that we get to hear these trains of thoughts. It's a miracle you're able to speak them. Like, keep. I didn't even know. Here's how messed up it is. I didn't think it was odd that I could not remember most of my life. Like, I'm so out of it. Like, I didn't question it. I didn't question it. Like, how do I go from like one thing and my life goes in a completely different direction and like, okay, this is what I'm doing now. Like, <laughs> How I'll get like, I'll have these really technical jobs. Like, how did I get in these really technical jobs? What is it I'm doing? So I'm starting to question like everything that I've done. But I mean, my, my, my amnesia and what happened in the programming was going active throughout my whole life because I know, um, I was telling you this, like I had in 2019, like, uh, end of 2019, I have no memory for like Thanksgiving, Christmas, anything like that. But in January of 2020, like my foot hurt. I couldn't figure out, I could hardly walk on my foot. I'm like, what the heck? Why does my foot hurt so bad? Like I was having to use like a hiking stick to like lean on, like walk like a cane on this thing. And I go to, I go to the doctor, they send me to like a, this like orthopedic, whatever, podiatrist, whatever, surgeon guy. And the guy, I'm like, I, my foot is hurt. I don't know what's going on. They take an x-ray of it. Um, and my, I have like a piece of my, he comes in, he comes in and he goes, I've been doing this for 30 years. And I've seen lots of things, but I have never seen that. Like, what happened to you? Were you like in a, were you in a car accident? Like, I, the, part of my heel bone had been broken off and wedged into my Achilles. And I had no memory of what happened. And in fact, I think I posted on Facebook, like, I guess I have selected memory, haha. -ha. But you know, like I literally like, it didn't even bother me that I had no memory of what happened to me. And the doctor's like looking at me like, how can you not remember what happened to you? And um, this gal I told the story to his nurse goes, well, he probably just thought you were drunk. And like, that's why you couldn't remember something like that. Like you got drunk and got in a car accident. and You didn't remember like, no, like none of that happened. But I mean, what, how is she going to explain it? But yeah. then here I am like three years later. And, and he wanted to have surgery to like cut off, cut open, to heal my Achilles back chain, you know, clean it out. Re reattach my Achilles, all this stuff. And, and I'm like, no, can we just like find something? I'll just try and like, I had a championship tournament. I was like, just, I want to suck it up. I'll pedal one legged or whatever. Like, I don't want to miss this. And then COVID happened. So like, I just, and I got flipped out and I left. So like, I just, 
suffered with it and it went away eventually but then later as i'm going through this healing process like i'm walking in in my rental and and i stepped on the rug weird and i just had this intense pain happen in my foot like it started aching and i hit this thing just right and i had this intense pain and when i had the intense pain i had a memory come and i was um <laughs> i was tied up in the room and and there was my david he was much older and an and a and a younger guy and they i was trying to get loose i was trying to get loose so i was tied up i was on the floor trying to get loose and this guy tackled me and we're like scrambling i'm fighting with him on the floor and david got angry and said i'm gonna give you something that you're never gonna forget and and whack me with a pipe on my on my and my ankle heel and that is how my heel busted but i couldn't remember for three years until like that pain happened and then that came loose whereas before i'm just like i don't know what happened blah 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 i have selective memory i guess like everything else i can't remember my childhood and that's that's hard to deal with to know like I still was so deeply having this happen to me because this happened know? like this happened right before you got the pain this wasn't a childhood memory this you were no. actually as an adult this is when I was 49 49 so this has been happening to me throughout my life And, and Heavenly Father has pulled me out of that. There's no, I mean, I just felt a calling to leave and didn't want to be locked down. And now I, since I had memories of being locked up in cages and tortured, no wonder I, like, so, like COVID backfired. Whatever big, weird, crazy thing that was all about that backfired for me like that set me loose when everybody isn't traveling I traveled like there were rest stops closed gas station closed like all this stuff like closed but I still was like I I'm driving like I'm out but <laughs> it probably was the best time for me to leave because everybody else was obey not leaving and I'll completely jetted and it's like you were able to finally sort of be alone and away from the areas that were accessing you and the people so your body probably felt safer to experience the memories and felt more liberated in a way because it knew it was far away from you know any of the abuse and where it occurred well and I was on the road all the time I don't I think the longest I ever stayed anywhere was like five days like I'll you know Except for like one specific period in the fall of 2021, like or fall of the fall of 2020 for a few months. But before that, like I and after that, like I was literally I'd, I'd most be there part of a week somewhere. And I would drive like a thousand miles in a day. Like I would drive like 16 hours. So in a way, like, I think it would be hard for anyone to keep up with me because I constantly was moving, constantly moving. And, you know, I, I can't really explain that except that's just what happened. And you read, like, books by Savali or whatever about trying to get away from wherever, like, I was constantly moving thousands of miles in and I have parts that people are like how do you drive 16 hours and I really think it's parts because I actually had a time where like I was I was in La Crosse, I was in La Crosse Wisconsin for a tournament and I was going through I was suffering I was having just this suicidal stuff and just this pain and I didn't understand what was happening and it was just triggering and I've looked back there's a it's a Masonic ritual day during this time period that I know now.
but like each year I've had problems because I've documented it. So like this last year I had problems. I went and looked back and I'm like, I wrote about the same thing. And I had written about the exact same thing on the exact same days. Like I'm having like this cycle of these days where there are rituals where things are really terrible. Um, but during this time, I, I didn't know what was happening. And I was like, I'm just going to try and grit it out. And I was supposed to have a tournament. It was going to be like a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I had everything packed and ready to go. And I was going to go to the boat, wake up at 4 a.m. and go to the boat ramp. And so I went to bed that night and just really stressed out. And I was supposed to be 4 a.m. at the boat ramp on Friday. I woke up in Tennessee on Saturday. <laughs> I woke up in Tennessee on Saturday. A part of me like decided that was enough and we we're in danger and get out and drove me a thousand miles in one day back home. And I had to go back later to, <laughs> to go back like later to catch up where I was supposed to be. But like literally a part of me did that. And that happened. And a friend, I guess my friend, my friend had, had t like called and that part had answered and then like, I'm driving, I'm, I'm going home. And they thought they meant that, that part of hijacked and was driving me to my folks home. There's a lot of worry about that. And, um, but they drove me a thousand miles from Wisconsin to Tennessee. And then I woke up. So much for a tournament. <laughs> How confusing. Not, I'm not that. the most successful angler right now as far as tournaments. So like I've been, and since then, like I feel like I've also gotten potentially accessed while I was driving last year on the road. And I and I think it happened when I was the year before, like uh going through with my sister's place and stuff. Like I had documented like I had. 23 bruises on my body and cuts and I didn't know where they all came from and so I think like I was so Holy Spirit when I this fall he had told me to sell my place in Utah and and settle here um like he really like gave me the Holy Spirit travel ban and it was really upsetting because I had just driven like a hundred thousand plus miles all over America and now I'm not going anywhere and I'm in like here like <laughs> that was such and I'm not doing the tournaments not doing the national tournaments and that was really upsetting for me as far as like this is how I had seen my life going and now like Holy Spirit is telling me I'm not going there I'm not going to this and I'm not going to that and and but I've understood now that that is a protection of me because I probably had parts put in me in danger at times. And and I need to be focused on that healing time right now. But. Wow. And that's, you know, I think hard for people to comprehend, too, how long this programming can go on for. You know, it's incomprehensible for people to think that you could go like your parents be in your 80s, still be being accessed, still be living this, you know, double life in a sense and not having any cognition of it consciously, you know, and, and that's, you hear that have, from so many survivors just all well, the and you have parts that report. So I have have parts that I know my friends have seen, like they'll call and then parts will answer and they're mommy and daddy and they're. And they have very weird conversations. Like my friends are like, this is the weirdest thing I've heard. Like it's so extremely detailed on like what they're doing and where they're going and like telling every exact detail. And I am telling every exact detail too. And you know, so like at this point, like I I'm aware of it. I don't, I at this point don't feel that that is happening like that. But I see, like, them try to trigger me. So, like, just, for example, and bless my mother and father. Lord, please, I want them. I want my mom and dad to be safe. Because I just don't believe that they are consciously, like, they get what they're doing. And maybe that's just me trying to live with it. But, um, 
they sent me uh so i have these rental properties that i'm trying to do for to protect me and my finances and things like that um my family <laughs> um they are like sent me things of like would you like these pictures for your rental right and I've, I've told them no i don't want stuff for my rental i'm full up everything's decorated i got it um sent me pictures and they are like old like paintings that i remember from a child that i had never like really thought of and i can't tell where they were but i remember the painting and it like did something inside like i felt something inside about these paintings but I couldn't remember like where they were but I remember staring at them and then they sent me I've had some problems with owls like horned owls it was one of my first like big flip outs was this horned owl and it like triggered me and I got lost and I couldn't figure out where I was they sent me pictures of horned owls and then they sent me a picture of my family crest and coat of arms like boom 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 and i'm like what <laughs> are they like i can't make this stuff up like this might seem totally random but we know that i'm i'm did i'm pro i'm programming i have family stuff and my family is sending me these pictures to do something to me and and i'm not sure that they understand or a part of them is doing it to try and do something and some people would say like you need to go no contact and, I, and I'm in a dilemma on that because Holy Spirit has not told me that Holy Spirit told me to buy them Bibles and send them Bibles and I bought them Bibles and I went to the church the like intercessors in church and I had asked them and they prayed with me all four, like three other intercessors and they prayed with me on the altar with those Bibles in church. And we anointed them and added anointing oil cloth to them and stuff. So, like, when I send it, like, hopefully is the power of the Holy Spirit will, will activate in that and pierce through that, right? He hasn't said, like, cut off contact. He's talking, you know, and there, so... But maybe that's also like my coach also says my parts are like Stockholm syndrome, right? True, but they're completely see. bonded to to people that have done horrible things to me. I'm bonded in my heart to my grandfather and I have memories of him delivering me to men to be raped, and I have memories of him making me touch him and him doing stuff to me. So I, but I still have those feelings of love and it to him is some messed up stuff that's why it's so hard to get out of this absolutely they make it so you can't you know that's the whole point they make it so you can't like you shouldn't be out of it it's amazing that people like you and lisa you know nathan all these other survivors somehow just don't grasp and like take on the programming fully like there is a part of you that is connected to the holy spirit the whole time and never lets go you know no matter how much they throw at you it's like your spirit just never breaks and some people their spirit does you know and, and it's like the anomalies why do some people just not take it and it's it's not many in comparison to the amount that do stay in this their whole life but it's amazing that you're here and you're able to talk about this today, you know, and that you're able to recognize all of this and be able to understand programming enough to see when those things are happening and to reverse engineer moments and say, wait a minute, I have some questions about this, or this doesn't seem right. When those same things were probably happening your whole life and like never a question came up before about any no. of it. No, that's the trick is like, I'll tell my friends, like, I'm sure I wasn't like this. And I'm like, I've probably like, <laughs> I've been DID my whole life. I'm a I've been a program multiple my whole life, and now I'm like I've, I'm coming to and I'm working through this, and the Holy Spirit is healing me through this. But like I'm I know I'm early in my journey, and so for those of you who are looking at me going like, "Oh, girl, don't get it," like yeah. give me 
give me some grace, please, because I'm trying so hard. It is a lot, is a lot. And what I've gone through, like, I feel like I don't get a break. Like, it's just coming very rapidly with, the, you know, like, I wake up often at night, like, with body memories. Like, I'll be in just, like, the other day I had, like, um, like, I felt like my jaw was, like, injured and I, and just all sore on my jaw like a lump in my hand I have a lot of problem with my hand like my hand was like raised up I woke up with my hand raised up and it was excruciating I couldn't bend my fingers and it's just some weird like the processing doesn't always happen with like a memory the processing happens sometimes for me like in my body first like I will have it and I'll start feeling it in my body and then I will feel emotions that I don't understand where they're coming from. And then like I will have a memory. It isn't always like, boom, I have some memory and I have an aha moment and I can link things together. It's a lot of feeling like I don't understand why this is happening. I don't understand why I'm feeling this in my body. I don't understand why I'm having these emotions that don't fit the situation. So, yeah. I can't even imagine how confusing that is. When in your journey did satanic ritual abuse and like Masonic abuse come in? Because I'm sure that those weren't terms that you just knew right off the bat. How did you kind of link that together and figure out, oh, that's what I, that's exactly what I was going through. (laughs) Well, like I told you, that was the first thing Holy Spirit told me was like my grandfather had used me in rituals and sold me the Bail, and I'm like, what the heck is that? What is that all about? Like, I had to learn what that was, and then I'm learn like I was just like diving into this learning. But um, when I went to first see a counselor, um, <laughs> she tried to send me to like some intercessory prayer ladies, um, and I had been documenting, like I've been like Holy Spirit told me to write things. So I had been documenting all this stuff that had been happening. So I just like sent them like emails with like all this like terrible stuff that I'm experiencing. And they like reject. So the first lady's like, do you know what we're talking about here? Like, you know what's happening? And I'm like, I don't know. I'm just having this stuff. Like I'm just having spiritual warfare. Like I was so clueless. And they're like, they said like, you're too severe and for this like we don't even have the resources to deal with this and the severe severity of your of like this ritual abuse and stuff and then they and I'm like okay now what like (laughs) I'm I'm that bad like what's wrong with me you know like I didn't know like this and they sent me um They sent me a link to some podcast by Mary Lou Lake. I don't know if you've ever heard her story. Um, Just like, here's some information. (laughs) Like, so I started trying to listen to these podcasts. And she started talking about Freemasonry and Satanic. And I would try and listen and I would pass out. I couldn't get through. I couldn't get through like five minutes of a podcast. I would pass out. And I wake up like an hour later and I would have to restart the podcast. And like, I must've had to listen, like first one, I must've had listened to at least 20 times to try and get like halfway through it because I would literally like the information start to come in and my, my whole system would just shut down. I pass out. So it, it was pretty hard to adjust to, but you know, I think I was fortunate in that I had, you know, uh, some friends who had walked with that was an SRA survivor that had walked with other SRA survivors that could answer questions and and help me in this, you know, as I was experiencing stuff and helped me to find help and, and really like things really shifted big time. Um, like when watching your podcast, watching Lisa's podcast, um and the information of you know like um amy pfeffers helped me a tremendous amount i've gotten really good information from 
you know, watching Kate Tolman and Kathy O'Brien. I mean, it's really like, I think that's the hard, one of the hardest things as a survivor is you feel like you have to be your own researcher and try to like take all this information and, and not try and understand, like you want to understand your own story and, but understand what other people are going through, but you don't want to like somehow like adopt that into you like that. You know, I get scared like watching stuff because it's like, I just want to know what happened to me. Like, I want to understand what's happening. But you have to take this information in. You have to be like your own like intense researcher and, and try and find like trying to find things without triggering yourself left and right and, and try and understand it. When you hear people talk about for me, like like Faye Russell talking about the Masonic ritual abuse that she endured and the the name of stuff and it's like that is me or i hear nathan reynolds talk about s stuff in the desert and that is me like i have these things and it just it's like when you start getting chunks of similarities and people start explaining the kind of like the programming has been the hardest to understand and deal with of like because it, it's such a bot, like, I tried to describe the suicide program and that would kick off. Like, it's such a biological urge to kill yourself. It isn't like, I'm fine. I'm not even suicidal. I'm fine. I go through something difficult. And then all of a sudden, I just want to die. And nothing, nothing terrible. I wasn't depressed. I wasn't anything. It's just like something like a the switch gets flipped. And it's like being underwater and trying to hold your breath is like fighting this, like this drive, this urge. And you have to like fight against it because it's a program, is a program on your parts trying to do this stupid stuff. But that's like the biggest thing is just the knowledge, trying to find the information because it's, it's all over. And you're like, is this really real stuff is this like baloney is it <laughs> you know yeah and try and understand and then try and go this is what happened to me and then have people hear you and risk being like the crazy lady at church and <laughs> you know if you if you're lucky to find people and i've been very lucky in being in a church that has people that are they don't necessarily totally understand my my pastor's like i don't understand parts I just know, I know Holy Spirit. I don't understand parts. He's like, I'm just going to pray all the parts away. And I'm like, oh, bless you. Like, I mean, I know he means well. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's you don't, not though. everybody. Yeah. Like they listen and they are fighting with me. They may not understand it, but they're still see they that I'm seeking. It. Yes. And be like, well, I don't understand it. It's not real. They're like, I don't get it, but I'm going to sit with you. And they're opening their eyes and even like this whole like sound of freedom movie has had discussions about it. I mean, I was in church on Mother's Day and they with a couple that, and I was already struggling because of Mother's Day and things, but they start talking about, so I think the sound of freedom in the trailer and the guy started talking about on a boat and going, these guys going to rescue people. And I'm standing in church and suddenly I like, I go into a straight flashback right in front of these people. Like I'm in the church and then I'm not in the church. Like I'm standing and I'm and like I'm barefoot and I'm in the dirt and there is bodies and there's blood and I'm just and then I'm back in the church and I feel like I'm gonna pass out and I go sit down because like all the blood is drained out of me. And then I'm like I'm like time feel like I'm time traveling. I'm in this flashback and then I'm in the church. I'm in this flashback and then people are trying to talk to me and I cannot even like figure out where I am what's happening I mean and I'm like I must and I'm distraught and I'm like am I like what am I in you know but that and they're talking about survivors and rescuing and they're literally talking to, to survivor to two survivors because I was with my friend they're talking about the sound of freedom and rescuing people and sex trafficking about survivors and there's literally two survivors standing right in front of them you know and they're learning they're learning but like i had a complete flashback right in front of them i heard one of them go she okay <laughs> like 
<laughs> like I'm in two you places don't... at once. Give me a break. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was a mess, but I've also been um very risky in church as far as telling people a little bit. I don't want to like secondarily traumatize anyone. But I have shared my struggles because I feel like one thing of going through all this is that I see the demonic like I just see in the spiritual the demonic I can feel it and I feel like I know how to swing my sword and so I fight and I fight for the church and I fight for the people in that church right but they're learning so like I can share what I have learned in spiritual warfare and fight for them and share in that but I also like explain like this is some messed up stuff at the same time and I think too you doing that in church I think that that's a huge sign for people that look for churches is the church accepting of having hard conversations even if they don't understand it you know you talk to people like Lisa Meister who I mean every church she's you know she's found a couple that were good but you know 99% of the churches she walked into wanted nothing to do with that conversation you know and so you can tell a lot by where you're at by how people respond to these yeah. hard Stations. Are they at least willing to listen to it and entertain it versus get out of my church? You're not allowed to talk about that in here. They are willing to listen. And here's what's happening is that as I've been to talking and other survivors like and this stuff is coming up and they are seeking and they are wanting to do warfare and they're wanting to learn deliverance and they're wanting to talk about this stuff. Like. I. <laughs> I've seen other survivors that aren't coming out, that aren't out yet. Like I've been in, in service, even on Wednesday, we had a woman that came in that to me was like an obvious program multiple that came in and she came in and we were praying and I just started coming against everything. Like I come, like I know I just started coming against all the stuff and praying. And that woman just like a part of her came to Jesus and she, the rest of her didn't know what happened, but she's like there and she is switching and she is going like she started having like, like demonic tongues and she's starting and, you know, and I'm like binding and loosing and binding and loosing and, she, and Holy Spirit came right for that woman and some part of her got saved, but the other part, like she didn't know. And I felt like she got sent there. <laughs> I wondered if she got sent there because I was there. But like, I'm, t I'm like next to this man and I'm just like praying in the spirit and I'm coming and, and, and he's like, he's like, Kate, Kate, she is just like you. And I'm like, yeah, she is just like me. Right. She is just like me. He goes, I, he goes, but she's like not begun her journey yet. Like he has come for her heart and she, she is in the start. And I told her, she's like, I, and the voice, she started talking to me, the voices, the voices tell me to do bad things. And I, and these things are, and I'm like, you need to like call to Jesus, focus on Jesus and stand against those voices. Right. And I gave her the same things that I have done, but, but my church friends are like, she is like you. And they're trying to like figure out why she is like me. Right. They're like that. You can see like he's like, I'm trying to understand, but she is like you. I'm like, yeah. And I went to passion. I'm like, she is like me. Like because she is because she is switching like rapid switching right in front of them. And they're not. I know I've switched, but not like that. And and manifesting and they're seeing it right there. Like their eyes are open. Wow. And I just know like that. The Holy Spirit is revealing that. He is revealing that in our church. And no, nobody's perfect. Like, there's issues everywhere. But, um, yeah. Gosh, you've come so far in such a short amount of time. I know it probably doesn't feel like that. I know that, you know, even times that we've talked, it feels so just, hopeless at times and, and you're still going through the unwinding of the programming but man it's amazing to see how far you've come and that you're able to have that influence on other people already and get them in a place to where they can receive the information you're very good at breaking it down in a palatable way and you do it in a way that because <laughs> some people uh, 
you know, the delivery can be really harsh. And I think people just want to look away and you're very gentle with it. In a sense, uh, that, like, I think people are more curious than, than feeling <laughs> that intense emotion that can be associated with it. And I love seeing the impact that you're making in such a short amount of time and that you have this community that you've built simply because you've listened to Holy Spirit tell you to use your voice and you've been guided by that. And he's guided you to places, to people, to therapists, to podcasts that are willing to listen and and hold space for you. Despite the fact that, you know, this isn't something that's talked about often. It's not even something that's accepted in a lot of these environments and somehow like Holy Spirit's leading you to build a community around you and you're having an impact on it. Hmm. It's amazing. Holy you know. Spirit, though. You understand that it's Holy Spirit, Emma. Like me talking to you in an intelligible and focused way right now is all Holy Spirit. Because I'm sure you could you could ask Amy in my sessions, I really struggle to even like be present or when I have get triggered, like I'm a hot mess. I'm I'm compl- like it's a, it's very difficult. So me what i'm saying and what i'm talking about this is all holy spirit through me because i'm i'm normally not (laughs) i'm normally not as like totally on it though you know like so i just hope like what i've talked about and what i've shared i have been transparent about what my journey is and my journey isn't over and i'm still learning and i'm new in this process but maybe that it help someone that is also new that is feeling like they're a complete mess that there is that there is hope and that Jesus can heal this and and you just have to keep taking it to him and asking for that healing in it and that there's people out there that can that can help in that so i just that's just my hope and it is, like, this is going to help people on this podcast, on Lisa's podcast, in your church. Every time that a survivor speaks and finds somebody that can listen, you know, we're breaking the spell. We're breaking it one person at a time, one community at a time, one one church at a time, one podcast at a time, you know, and, and you're, you're paving the way for that and figuring that out so early. And I think too, like that is such a big part of the programming, obviously, the don't, don't speak, don't tell suicide programming. It's all about containing it and keeping, keeping that within you and not speaking it. So every time you do too, it's like, you're just, you're demolishing all the walls that they built to keep it inside of you. Like you're chipping away at it and just breaking yes. away everything that, that they built. Yes. Inside of you. I want to break it because I'm tired of suffering. I didn't choose this. And what happened to me was horrific. And I've survived it, but I suffer. It is awful. And I I want to not suffer. I want to be spend the last parts of my life, my last autumn, you know, I'm 53. I want to spend the rest of it catching big bass and having joy and eating ice cream and not crying in my tabernacle and can't put sentences together and wanting to die. And wondering what's wrong with me and having wacky parts drive me all over the country. You know, (laughs) I would like to feel like have a good life and make a difference and and not suffer because it sucks. You're doing that. And it probably, like I said, it probably doesn't always feel good. I know it doesn't always feel good. It probably feels more worse than, you know, better most days. But one day at a time and one person at a time, like you're so brave and courageous and resilient and just intuitive to be able to do this. And you did amazing today. I know you were worried about that and you were nervous in the beginning. And if you wouldn't I was because I couldn't even put I couldn't even put sentences together yesterday <laughs> and was running around saying I'm a bad dog. So I was like, this is not gonna turn out great. And that but... amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Was there and anything thank else you to that everybody you that thank you to everybody that has prayed for me during this podcast? Because by the way, like I asked for help, I asked for help in prayer, and there's a lot of women been layering both of us in prayer for this discussion. So 
And you yeah. went through a powerful prayer right before this too. Yeah. Lots of prayers. Is there anything else that you wanted to share about your story this time? I would love to have you on again. I think there's so much more that, you know, we could talk about. And especially as you unearth more or as you learn more about certain things, you know, I always love to see as survivors wake up sort of what they start specializing in, you know, like Lisa really tackles like the SRA, you know, and, and it seems like people just start latching on to these, these topics or these things that they feel very strongly about. And I'm, I'm really excited to see your journey grow and to see where you take this. And so I'd love to obviously have you back, but if there's any, I'd love, you know, to turn it over to you, if there's anything that you wanted to talk about today that we didn't get to yet. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've covered a, a large breadth, a large Good. portion today. And I just, I feel like I've said what I'm supposed to say. And I just, if anything, like if you, if you're going through this, like, and, and you're not sure about Jesus, like that's okay, but you can, you can ask him into your heart. Like you don't have to be like all in cannonball. If you don't trust, if you know, if you've gone through this, it's very hard to trust Jesus because they do horrible things, mocking Jesus and pretending to be Jesus and hurt little kids. And, you know, like, I would just urge you to, like, try and take that risk of asking him into your heart and taking those first steps with him. Because that is where the healing has come from. And he does heal when you give it to him and ask him into it. Like he, I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. Like when you have memories and you feel the pain, but he has taken that pain from my memories. I still have the memories. I don't have the amnesia, but I don't have the suffering of those memories that I have to physically feel or go through. And and I know, like, as far as the calling, like, I, I'm i waiting to see really what that is. But I feel like, you know, I'm a fish. Um, hopefully we'll be fishing again. I don't know what he has planned for me. But I feel like I'm supposed, like, he has told me I will, I'm going to, I'm going through this so that I can help others go through this. And I don't know what form that takes. You know, um, but I just would like to invite people that have discovered like they're suddenly in the occult. They've been in stuff that they just haven't understood really the damage and the depth of it. Like, it's okay. And you don't have to t be self-tormenting over that, that you can ask, repent and ask forgiveness for that. And you are forgiven and you can find that healing in Jesus. So that's what I would say. That's so powerful and such a beautiful note to sort of close up on just because that's, you know, that's what this is all about. Like we, we need to tell these stories so people are educated, but we also don't want to leave people hopeless, you know, and I love that you gave an awesome resource, that book, which I'm going to put in the show notes, you yeah. know, you're writing resources, things that helped you. I know that everybody's different. We can't prescribe one, one method of healing, but Part of the reason that I love this show is because everybody on it has either similar things that come up often, you know, books that come up often, authors, um, podcasts, resources, types of therapy. But then there's also very unique things that help people. And I think like the bigger we can make these toolboxes, the more that, we, that we're giving people on the other end who are suffering, who say, gosh, I'm going through all this stuff. Now I have a hundred different things that I can try, which is awesome because maybe not yeah. all will work. But, you yeah. know, 20 years ago, trying to find some type of remedy or therapy for this, like you wouldn't even be able to find a keyword. You know, there wasn't even yeah. like Internet, you know, back when a lot of people were waking up. So it's like, how do you even yeah. discover this? Like, it's such an awesome time. There's that not there's not a Dewey Decimal System for <laughs> SRA, right? <laughs> decimal system. Oh, my God. We're <laughs> showing my age too at that one. That was yeah. so in school. That was so hard yeah. to find stuff. You had to go yeah. through every my little, little card catalog. I'd like the card catalog for occultic rituals, please. 
Yeah. Oh my gosh. Right. We're now, we just have it right on our computers. We can just go on and Google, you know? Yeah. So I want to thank you, Kate. Thank you so much. You've been You're such welcome. a big support. Like even before I knew that you had a story, you were popping on the, you know, the premieres and commenting and you've been such a huge support and inspiration for me and like a rock, you know, like you're just so constant with encouraging me and encouraging all the guests and like leaving the most incredible feedback. And I know that it has to be so hard sometimes, like you carry your own weight and you're still showing up with just being a beacon of light of hope, you know, and, and I couldn't believe that you are a survivor whenever you had went on Lisa's show, whenever you had told me, because I'm like, she is like the brightest light. Like I would have thought that you just had this amazing life and, you know, nothing was wrong, you know, and, and yeah. you carry all this. I'm weight. just, I'm just learning. I'm just learning. You're oh. amazing. You lead with so much love in your heart and we're so much better for you. And I know people on the other end are going to feel the same way that I do just inspired and, and just in awe of, of your strength and, and of how far you've come in such a short amount of time. That's really inspiring for people. Do you have social media or, or ways that people can keep up with you or get in contact with you if they want? And no worries if not, but. Uh, I do, but I'm going to be honest. Like, this is my first time talking about this with like my first and last name and being out there. Um, So I don't really talk about this, about my own struggle, because my family is still like, you know, they watch on my social media and stuff. It's struggle, but. Um, but I'm going to go out there. You, um, I have a website and it's, uh, really boring. It's about fishing and it's hardly updated because Holy Spirit has me on a travel ban. So, <laughs> so, but it's, it's katefishing.com. Um, and that has my socials and everything on it. Um, mainly I'm on Instagram as Catherine underscore field. Um, but you can find me if you search Kate fishing and I have a YouTube uh, Kate fishing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I haven't done any videos for like a year. Cause I gotta be honest, like with my parts coming out, I got really self-conscious about what was happening to me and I didn't want people to know it. That makes sense. Right. With parts coming out because I was in tournaments and I'm recording on my GoPro and I'm amnesic and I have parts coming out during a fishing tournament that hate fishing. So, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, uh, it's not, you know, or don't know how to, like, it's not the greatest combination. How I've managed to, like, pet any checks is beyond me. But um, <laughs> I got very sensitive about what was happening to me. And so I really, I have good videos on there and you're welcome to watch them. I even have, like, a vlog that's really dorky. Cool. of like when I was traveling and stuff um but you know I hope I hope at some point when I'm things are a little more healed in me that I will I will go back to the videos and doing the vlog and stuff but so yeah right now it's pretty much I'm on Instagram um sparingly and trying not to be a complete idiot and have parts go and say dumb stuff. That is <laughs> that is where I'm at right now. <laughs> because because oh I'm trying not to make trouble for myself. But uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I'll link all of that below. That's really awesome. And like I said, I'm excited to see like what you you know what you do in the future using this part of your story, you know, whether it's vlogging or starting a blog, whatever it is, I think that you are just getting started on a really grand journey that, that the Holy Spirit's guiding you to in this movement. And I think you're going to have a very powerful voice and that you're going to change a lot of lives. I hope, I hope I make a difference. So thank you for the time talking and I appreciate it. It's an honor, an absolute honor. You've been such a big support. And I know that we've talked about coming on before. And, and know, I was like, not unless Holy Spirit says, no way. <laughs> I'm not being called to yet. Yes. <laughs> and then like six months later, hey, Holy Spirit said, <laughs> talk to you. I'm being obedient. I don't want to do it. <laughs> Perfect timing right now. <laughs> and so I'm going to link all of that below. 
And for right. people listening, like a lot of you who are on the YouTube channel and who are on the premieres every Sunday, and if you're not, if you're listening on Spotify or iTunes, like come join the premiere on Sunday nights at 6 p.m. Central Time. It's really fun. Mm -hmm. We have an awesome community there. A lot of the guests are there that have been on my podcast, a lot of survivors. It's a really beautiful community that, that we have that shows up every Sunday. And Kate is so loyal. She's there every single Sunday that she possibly can so uplifting you guys are you know have very easy access to her that way too if you want to come ask her questions and you know just lift her up so come hang out but I'm going to list all of her links below yeah. and if you want to learn how to kayak fish for bass I got some video for you you Those might are have some skills, skills you know <laughs> they're valuable skills <laughs> I just it's a god-given gift I'm sort of like good at it and I like it but that's cool you know we'll see what happens it's really so. cool and yes go support Kate on her YouTube channel go watch <laughs> videos lift her up give go her watch my one-year-old plus videos of <laughs> yeah so I could say the same about my podcast, go back three years and listen. And it's like, oh my Lord, I, I still don't always know what I'm doing, but like, I really didn't know what I was doing back then. So that's just part, that's part for the core with doing this. <laughs> I, I will say like, in some ways, like how I approach bass fishing has helped me in going through this as a survivor, because I decided I, I started bass fishing, not known like a few years ago, I didn't know how to bass fish at all. And then I decided I was going to go just jump in the national tournament and just, yeah. So I like dove in head first and because I figured the way to get better is to go against the, the best people. So, so I did. Yeah. And, um, and I taught myself and I had given myself a goal of fish 250 days in a year, which is a lot. You have fish a lot every day, you know, like five days a week or some crazy goal I gave myself. But so I did, and I actually have like a video out there, um, a fish, to, maybe I'll send you the link and you can link it just for fun. But um, of this process of me, like going through different days of the 250 days of the beginning where I'm just catching little things to the end where I'm like finally catching like a limp, like just me catching like a limit. And then the next year, like I was, you know, in the big championships so by the next year, like, but like the first that first like methodical step by step by learning just different parts, you know, has helped me in, in a, a lot of ways in approaching my healing of just continually just keep going. Like I will go fish in the snow and in the dark and everything else. And I'm that same kind of determination is applied in just different ways. So. Absolutely. And just that, that, that consistency to do it that many days a week and to commit to it. Yeah. So that's cool. That's really, that gives, you know, a different twist too to these different things that other people might do that they can apply yeah. and look at their life and say, what have I been really self-disciplined in that I can, you know, use that skill and, and transfer yeah. to my healing. I think that's and maybe cool. it'll find and maybe you like fishing because it is out in nature and could be healing. So who knows? Maybe that'll be the secret strategy. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a beautiful person it's so great to see your smiling face and just to get to connect with you I know that this is going to be a really special episode for people to listen to especially because a lot of my listeners know you in one way or another they've seen you or, or <laughs> no with pressure you. <laughs> you're amazing you did so good today and everybody so support Kate I'm going to have all of her stuff below go ahead all right you know that's all I'm just saying <laughs> oh, oh gotcha I thought you were like I have something to say <laughs> no 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 <laughs> so go connect with kate go lift her up go watch her youtube learn how to fish and yeah I'll have my links below too so connect with me also especially on other platforms i never know what platforms are going to keep me in which ones are going to you know terminate me so the more that, that we can connect also you know it's it's a it's a great way for us to be able to always keep in touch no matter what happens so all my links will be below too you guys thank you so much for all your support god bless you and we will see you next week.